Okay, anyone opposed? Thank you. So um, next we'll move on and um, we will have our executive director report from DJ Seller. Great, thank you Madam Chair and good morning everybody. It's good to see folks here and good to hear folks on the phone. Uh, I am going to do something that Mr. Mormon instructed me one time to never do, so I do it at my own peril. Uh, the executive director's report, the hard copy was put out. You all have seen it on the website. Because of the timing of this meeting, the data is November data, so it's, it's good data and it's accurate data, but it's a little bit stale. Uh, I'll just point out at a high level, we're on track with everything we're doing. Ridership continues to look good. Our projects continue to look good. At the last meeting, we talked about a target of 20 VPRA staff members by the end of the calendar year. We did not hit that with people on board, but we did hit that with accepted offers. So as of the end of last year, we had 20 and now 21 accepted offers. So we're on track with hiring, which has been very challenging. Um, with that said, I would like to, with the permission of the board, bypass the executive director's report, assuming there are no questions, and instead talk about the winter storm that was, uh, that hit Virginia, the Commonwealth earlier this week, and talk about what happened, what we did, and what we're gonna do after action. So, any objections to that? Apologies, Mr. Mormon. <laughs> okay, then we have a PowerPoint that was not sent out that we will put on the screen uh, with some some information about the winter storm itself. Uh, winter storm Frida came, if, if we get that PowerPoint up, winter storm Frida came last weekend. We knew the storm was coming and, and thankfully, if you can go to the next slide, um, when storms come, the railroads, specifically Amtrak, our two host railroads, Norfolk Southern, CSX, VRE, get together, they know the storm is on its way and they make plans ahead of time for how to respond to the, the storm. Uh, even before the first piece of precipitation fell, we were, Amtrak dealt with the, the freights, dealt with VRE. Unfortunately, this was a storm that was atypical in many, many ways. First and foremost, it came on a day where the temperatures were literally 70 degrees and the, the ground was, was warm, so there were questions about whether the snow would stick. We knew it would be a lot of snow. There was a lot of rain that came first in the warm weather, so the ground was very, very soft. Winter weather came, Heavy snow brought down a lot of trees. CSX actually made the decision to close portions of the railroad. Norfolk Southern made the decision to continue to run. Uh, we made plans accordingly. We had canceled some trains and, and we kept some running. As you can see on this first slide, and, and I can promise you that that picture of the locomotive with that one tree in front of it, there were literally hundreds of trees further on down the track. Uh, lots of trees fell, Amtrak work with CSX, with Norfolk Southern, to clean the trees. As you can see on the slide, there were, were over a thousand trees cleared within the first 24 hours after the storm hit. If you go to the next slide, you get a summary of the Virginia state supported trains that were affected. We had train 176 that left Roanoke, headed to DC. It actually made it through Lynchburg and on the way to Charlottesville, got stopped between Lynchburg and Charlottesville because of trees that fell ahead of it. Uh, side note, behind that train was the Crescent, which is an Amtrak long distance train that comes up from New Orleans. That train made it to Lynchburg. At Lynchburg, they made the decision to go forward because they didn't think there were many trees blocking and they thought they could clear the path, and that's being uh, <coughs> the railroad. Unfortunately, that train left Lynchburg and was also stuck. So we had two trains stuck between Charlottesville and Lynchburg. At that point, the safest place for the passengers is on the train because they had power, they were warm, they had food. So the decision was made to try to clear the path going forward. When it was determined that there were many, many trees ahead and that they, the trains would be going into weather, the decision was made to back those trains back up into Lynchburg. Unfortunately, in the time between when the trains left Lynchburg and when they got stuck, trees had fallen behind, so they had to clear the path to shove the trains back. So that was train 176. Uh, we also had train 84 that was going from Norfolk to DC. That was blocked just north of Quantico and then eventually moved back to Quantico. Train 174 went Newport News to DC. That actually arrived in DC just doing a slight delay that, that beat the storm. Uh, and then as you can see there, there were three trains that were canceled. Again, if you look at the picture, you can see the, the sheer amount of debris that was on these railroad tracks. 
Next slide, please. As I referenced earlier, there were other trains that were affected. We had multiple freight trains that were also blocking the path on, on both sides. Um, CSX and Norfolk Southern both shut down their tracks in Virginia. Rich, I'm going to put you on the spot, but we had VRE service. The northbound trains worked fine. VRE canceled the southbound trains that were on the Fredericksburg line, so they too were affected by the storm. And then as you can see, Amtrak had a number of long distance trains that were also blocked to include some that terminated in Richmond or terminated in Petersburg. Uh, going to the next slide, we had trees falling throughout the storm. Uh, the crews were struggling to reach the trains. I think everybody heard about problems on the roads. Uh, the, the travel conditions were treacherous. VDOT was stressing stay off the roads if it's non-essential travel. Even with all of those warnings, it was very difficult for the railroad crews to get out to the right of way and clear the path. So it was really just a, a, a very difficult event. Bruno, are you on the line? Bruno Maestri from Amtrak? Yes. Do, do you want to speak, please, just a little bit about how Amtrak responded over those 24 to 36 hours? Sure. And, and you, you, you really laid out sort of the, the in, in initial communication that goes on, really, with respect to every weather event. Um, and, and as you said, this, this one, uh, the meteorologist got it a little bit wrong. And, uh, you know, it was a sort of a domino effect down the road. Um, you know, speaking to, uh, and you've sort of covered the number of trains that were a problem. We had two shelter in place in, in Richmond. Uh, and for those passengers, uh, they were delayed a good part of the day. And we did provide, uh, we went out and got uh, fed McDonald's and all sorts of other food and, and beverages to keep people uh, uh, fed and and uh, and also uh, meet other needs that they had while they were on the train. The big problem was train 20, the Crescent uh, in Lynchburg. And as you said, uh, we we left the station. It, it, and to show the intensity of this storm, at 7 a.m. we on that Monday we communicated with Norfolk Southern, and they said the infrastructure was open and clear. And by 9 a.m., two hours later, they reported that the infrastructure was closed. So. Uh, and that was largely due, as you said, not only to trees, but a number of power lines that were down across that infrastructure. And a good part of that infrastructure is not accessible by road, even though it, the roads were not very uh, accessible. But a lot of that has to be, uh, uh, the maintenance folks have to get there on a highway vehicle because of where the infrastructure is. And, uh, and because of all the block, block tracks with, with the trees, they couldn't get there they couldn't get to where they needed to get. So that was, that was uh, a pretty large problem. Again, there were over 500 trees on that uh, uh, Norfolk Southern line. Um, so we eventually did back the train into um, Lynchburg, train 20. And uh, there uh, we were sheltering in place uh, again uh, because that was the safest place for um, our customers. And we were communicating with them as we were communicated to by the host railroads, and it was uncertain as to when the railroad would be open. Um, so obviously people were getting frustrated because we couldn't with certainty tell them when we would be starting the service again. Uh, meanwhile, we did send some folks down from Washington to help manage the situation. Uh, we you know, fed breakfast, lunch, uh, we got food, uh, People were running out of diapers. We had a train master go out and buy diapers and formula for some of our passengers. But the fact that they had to stay overnight uh, was not something that we anticipated. And uh, it was unfortunate because had the situation been different, we might have tried to, to house them in a hotel overnight. And in retrospect, that's one of the things we're looking at in our after action situation. Um, but um, you know, we eventually, after you know, the train was eventually 30 hours late um, and uh, everyone eventually got where they needed to get uh, safely, but uh, certainly it was a terrible inconvenience. We apologize to our customers, and uh, we, we're, we're looking at this situation, particularly the communication aspect of it, because they certainly everyone deserves to know what's going on, and it's not clear that we gave them as uh, all the information that was available to us, uh, such as the fact that there were trees and power lines down in front of them, that would have been good to spell out probably in greater detail. And, um, and that's a lesson learned. And, uh, you know, we'll provide uh, the board with our 
uh, go forward plan here as we as we finalize sort of a review of what happened in this situation and as we come up with you know what will we be doing next time as you know that the two senators uh, were quite upset about this uh, and they've written uh, our bosses here a, a, a letter and we'll be responding to that and I'll share that with with you DJ and the board uh, what our response is, because that'll spell out what we'll be doing differently going forward. And I'm happy to take any questions. Super, thank you, Bruno. So that, that really ends the conversation about what happened. The, the next slide talks about what we're going to do for after action. Um, we are going to be working with CSX and with Norfolk Southern and with Veery and Amtrak, our operators, to ensure that we learn what went well and, and what didn't go well during this process. Uh, as you can see from the slide, Continued communication with customers is important. Making sure people have the right information. And even if it's bad news, we need to make sure that the bad news is out there so folks know exactly what's going on. A lot of the, the challenge here, as Bruno pointed out, was just the unknown. We, it was not clear how much was blocking the railway, both forward and backward. Um, and, and we just, we need to do a better job of getting that information to customers. But over the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll be working with the railroads to get a detailed after action report and a, hey, here's what we need to do next time. Um, the other issue that, w that Bruno talked about a little bit was the conditions on board during prolonged delays. I mean, the, the trains are only set up for a certain amount of food and a, a certain amount of time. The toilets became a big issue. Um, I think with communication, some of those concerns could have been alleviated, but um, more to come here. I I'll open it up. I, I don't know, Rich, if you wanna make any comments from a VRE point of view before for questions. Thanks, DJ. Uh, I think you pretty much covered it. I, I, I do want to say, though, and I think those pictures tell a lot of tales there. Uh, there, there was a, it was a Herculean effort, if you will, to the maintenance away folks, the onboard train crews, and even give some credit to our passengers and stuff. I mean, th th this was a tough time, and particularly those maintenance away crews out there <laughs> trying to clear trees, clear power lines and stuff. Um, in, in, a, in a very adverse situation, I think they, they should be commended for their effort. Granted, yes, in any, any incident like this, there's always lessons learned, there's always opportunity for improvement, but I don't, I don't wanna you know, step away from this topic without acknowledging those folks that spent you know, just an enormous amount of time, and particularly on the, uh, the CSX RFMP line, with I-95 shut down, there was a, the, the lack of ability to be able to get those crews relieved and uh, and bring in fresh forces and stuff like that to help them dig out. So I uh, just wanted to add to that. And again, as you mentioned, DJ, we, we are, as VRE, we are part of that, um, you know, after action debriefing and we're all looking for opportunities for improvement. So uh, yeah, just wanted to say that, DJ. Thank you, Rich. And let me add to that, the onboard crews. I mean, the onboard crews expect to work their eight hour or 12 hour shift and then go home. And the folks running the train, the onboard conductors, they stayed on the train, the onboard services folks, they were all there while many people across the Commonwealth were, were really hunkered down at home, dealing with power loss at their own house, taking care of their families. These folks were out there trying to make sure that our passengers got where they wanted to get safely. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. We can't lose sight of that. Um, let me open it up to questions. Anybody, uh, any board members have questions uh, on the event or, or what we're doing after action? Uh, question, Chair? Question? Is this, am I yeah. captured? Um, have we had a situation like this within the near past where, you know, people have actually been trapped on trains for as long as, um, I, I don't remember on I-95, anybody being stuck on I-95 for 24 hours or more. Um, Senator Kane. Yes, Senator Kane, yes. Uh, this time testify. I think it was the same, right, on he the road. He can testify, but have we, have we had this situation before with, uh, with Amtrak, with our passenger rail, In or VRE, um, okay. where people have been trapped? And I, I guess just, I'm asking that question. I can just go question. back to about 13 years ago. If you remember in the 2009-2010 time frame, right. uh, we, we had a series of storms 2009 in December and then in 2010 after. The difference there was even though those events had a eventually a large accumulation of snow, they didn't, it, the snow did not come down 
at a rate per hour like this storm did Monday morning. So in other words, it came down, albeit over a couple of, you know, several hours or even a couple of day period, and the total accumulation was high. So that, that gave us an opportunity to essentially keep up with it, if you will. And then eventually trains were canceled and, and uh, you know, for a couple of days to, to get things uh, recovered from that. But that's the only one I can recall in 13 years, 14 years. I, I agree with that. The Virginia, as far as the state supported trains of Virginia, have never had folks stuck on a train for this long. I mean, there was the 2009, 2010 event, um, but there was not the warmth ahead of time and the soft ground that really brought down as many trees and power lines. Uh, Amtrak, and, and I don't want to speak for Amtrak, there have been times in the past where Amtrak has had situations that have had significantly lengthy delays, um, but this is the longest in Virginia, at least over the last two decades that I've been involved with Virginia. I guess I was I was wondering if there was you know a need to store some critical items like diapers and things like that that people you know were in need of and were not available. Uh, are there items that we should store on passenger trains uh, in the event of you know a lengthy de delay? Um, maybe thinking in terms of what were some of the things that had we only known. Um, are there some things that that we may want to have, you know, stored on on trains for passengers? That's a good point, and we'll include that in our after-action discussion. I mean, we're all advised that in your car, especially in the winter, you should have a blanket, you should have some food. Right. That makes sense on the trains to, to make those kind of accommodations as well. I, I think also looking at the stations as well, we had a number of people that spent the night in Staples Mill. Um, station. They were actually on, I uh, believe, the long distance trains. But um, I, I think that's just another area that when we do look at the after action review is, is how um, maybe we can better equip our stations or have, have um, more preparations available in when we expect a snow emergency. Okay. Agreed. We'll put that in the report. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments about the winter event? I, I, one quick question for you, DJ. So you reference the after action report, will that report be then encompassing a broader sort of government wide after action report or will this be solely focused uh, focus within the, the passenger rail, rail wheelhouse, if you will, because obviously we're in an interconnected transportation system obviously and so what happens with respect to surface impacts rail and, and, and vice versa. So just curious how that, how that review will take place and who, who will have the lead there. We've, we've spoken to VDOT on uh, many occasions over the course of the last week about how we all as transportation could have done a better job. At this point, I'm not aware if there's going to be one Commonwealth DOT after action report. I would imagine there will be, but I, I just don't know that that's happening and, and rail would be a part of that. Sure. I, I do know Commissioner Britch and, and his team also did an incredible job of just getting out and, and addressing this storm. That's being looked at closely and, and Virginia will have some kind of a, an after action report and we'll make sure that our information is part of that. Thank you. Um, anybody on the phone um, or on WebEx that also has may have a question for DJ? This is Maria Zimmerman and um, I just want to thank you for, for making the time and the space to share this report with us and certainly applaud um, all the work of the, the, the crews at the various railroads who, who were helping to respond and be responsive. While this was a hopefully a, a somewhat unusual storm, um, anytime you're on Amtrak and there's a significant delay for many hours, I know I've been on some of those that have been five or six hour delays. It, I think the communication issue isn't just about this one event. And, and I think looking at it and learning from it is great, but, but how do we, in expanding rail throughout Virginia and really thinking about that communications piece. Um, I know when I've been in that situation, you're looking at your app, you're looking at Twitter, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out where there's information you can get. And I think just, you know, um, the opportunity looking forward to make sure there's a consistent, reliable, up-to-date way to get information as you were talking about Bruno, I, I think is just really important to give um, passengers and their family peace of mind. Um, whenever these kinds of things strike. So I, I hope that will also be part of this longer term look ahead. 
Thank so you for more that. comment than a question, uh, unless Bruno, that there are things that Amtrak is doing with that, but I, I, I just know yeah, I've no. been in that situation, thankfully not for as long, and I would much rather be in an Amtrak station than on my car yeah. uh, for 27 hours in a snowstorm, but um, curious about that longer term comms commitment. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point, and and I think that the 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 right word that you said is consistent, because uh, you know we our our onboard people do make announcements. For example, if there's freight train delay, that you know we can't get by a freight train, and we you know we know that we're going to be late, or uh, you know frequently uh, there's some sort of issue with a vehicle strike on the on the railroad or or other situation that causes us to stop the train for some period of time. But I think it's not a consistent way of handling it, and that's what we're working on. And I think that will be part of this after action uh, report. Great, thank you. Anybody else that, um, on the phone that may have some questions? Uh, Jay? No, I, I was just gonna, I, I really like the focus on communication, and I appreciate the presentation too. It was really informative seeing those trees on the track, I mean, really help anyone understand how difficult an issue it is to respond to, especially when those are such isolated locations. <laughs> it was impossible to get around by car, let alone how you, how you get to those locations. So uh, along with the emphasis on, on communication, I agree that the last place you wanna be is in a car, next would be in the train, and the, and the optimal place is to be off the train in a town you weren't planning to be in in a hotel, right? So the question, what I might add to the after action to be really as clear as possible about is how you find out about the track disruption. In other words, in real time, is there a way, and I don't know the answer to that, when do you know that the track is blocked? Um, and it, you mentioned earlier in the report that you relied on uh, Norfolk Southern to, to say that it was open. So at what point and how do they know that in fact there's a blockage? Um, so that, that would be one of the first things. And the second is how you get to the location to remove it. And, and if you could comment on that, I'm, I'm a, is there something that goes on the track to get there? So if you could comment on those two things. So the second question is a little harder because the <coughs> diversity of the locations is, is really significant. There are some places that are readily accessible by roads. There are some places that along the right of way, there are access roads that heavy trucks can go along, and there are other places that you can only get to if you high rail there, which is you know, have a high rail vehicle that actually goes on the track. So depending on where you are, there are different accessibility um, situations, and, and, and that's something that we rely on the host railroad to, to deal with. Your first question, though, the, the host railroads, Norfolk Southern, CSX, they constantly monitor the conditions of the railroad, and, and they know when it's blocked. As soon as they know, they let Amtrak know, and Amtrak, to their credit, specifically in this, was in virtually constant communication with us on how the railroad was operating. Um, as we talked about earlier, Sunday night, CSX in, in some parts was already saying, we're not gonna run trains here because it's too much of a risk. Um, and as we found out from Norfolk Southern, Amtrak found out first and then we found out. So we knew where the trains were and where things were accessible. What we don't know and what's difficult to know is whether there's one tree down or whether there are dozens of trees down. and that you only find out when the crews get out actually on the right of way, which is very difficult. Which is very so difficult. that's kind of my question. They're, they're, it's not that there are cameras monitoring this it, or sensing that something fell on the track. H how do they actually know? Visually, somebody has to see it? Yeah. Uh, for the most part, that's the way it is. I mean, there, there are some parts of the right of way that have cameras. Amtrak, for example, right. between Washington and Boston has cameras in places, and, and yeah. obviously and it, it's more populated, people can see right. it. But some of the places in southwest Virginia and, and really right. between Lynchburg and here, there are miles and miles where right. there's just not a, a population. Well, that's why I might just add that to the after action is, is the, if, you, if you had real time information, you know, uh, because we don't know when the train was let out of Lynchburg if there in fact already was a, a, tr a tree over the track. To the degree there's any technological solution to that, it, it might allow for different decision making at that moment. That's a great point. Quite frequently, you're relying on the person in the cab to, to see the condition. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good report. Great. Any other questions? Anybody else on the phone? Oh, great. Um, 
Anything else that for your report at this point? Nope, thank you, I appreciate it. Great, thank you, DJ. Um, so next, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Devin Barnhart with Capital Transportation Consulting. She is gonna be speaking with us about the, in, the um, federal bill, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, which I know you all are very aware of, um, but we wanted to give you an opportunity to hear some more about the specifics that are in the bill, particularly as it relates to passenger rail funding. So, Devin, welcome. Is on? There we go. Hi, everyone, I'm Devin Barnhart. And this is me without a mask. I am smiling <laughs> at all of you. Um, I am an infrastructure consultant. Basically, I just help states, MPOs, transit agencies deal with Congress. Um, just a little bit about my background. I was on the Hill for more than 10 years, focused on rail policy specifically, but also all of surface transportation. Worked on a bunch of the past um, authorization bills, also the appropriations bills, which is where normally the real money comes from. Um, and really just excited to talk to you all about what was in this bill. One other quick thing, in addition to being a consultant, I'm also the executive director of the One Rail Coalition. This is a coalition of all the, age, or all the um, associations that work at the federal level on rail. So it's AAR and Amtrak, hello Bruno. Um, the labor groups, engineering, suppliers, it's the whole world of the freight and passenger system. Um, and so at the end of the slides, or at the end of my presentation, I have a couple of slides focused on some polling that we did just this past year, but we also did polling the year before just to show you some of the sentiment around transit and rail um, during these times. So next slide, please. Okay, so everyone talks about infrastructure as if it's a lot of things, and it's very confusing in the press, and for those of us who do infrastructure as a job, it's mind-boggling. I'm a civil engineer and a lawyer. I like words to mean to match their meaning and in this context they really don't. So I'm just going to focus us on what specifically we're talking about when we talk about the infrastructure bill. The smaller sort of greenish circle, that's the infrastructure bill we're going to focus on today. Um, that bill, they, they have decided to call it the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. IIJA is a mouthful. We'll just call it Bill for short. It is the things that we know and love on infrastructure, right? It's all the surface transportation modes, broadband, resilience. It's, it's the hard infrastructure you think of when you picture the word. Um, there is also another bill they sometimes call infrastructure that is called Build Back Better. It has 15 other titles. Reconciliation, family infrastructure, soft infrastructure, social infrastructure. It's a whole host of things, but it's a, it's a separate um, but also important bill that sometimes gets slumped together. So I just flag that bill is out there. It has not passed. It does have infrastructure money that we all might care about in there. There's $10 billion for transit with really broad eligibility and another 10 billion for high-speed rail. Unclear where that bill ends up, but it exists and people will continue to talk about it and sometimes call it infrastructure. But back to the main bill, which is the smaller, albeit not small, infrastructure bill. If you go to the next slide, please. This bill is actually two bills combined in one. Some may say it's multiple bills combined in one, but for our purposes, it's the policy bill. So every five years, we pass a big surface transportation policy bill that sets all the requirements for highway and transit and rail projects, as well as um, how our MPOs do planning and a host of other things. But that policy bill is important to us because it's, it sets the structure for how we implement all of the new money that's coming. The other side is the shiny side, that is plus up funding. This is sort of once in a lifetime plus up big infrastructure um, funding. So, but both of these bills are important for our purpose, or both sides of this bill are important for our purposes. Next slide. This is just a, a picture of what the plus up money looks like. This is not all of the money in the bill, but this is the new plus up appropriations money that will be available shortly. Um, and I use that shortly sort of in quotations. It will be coming sometime soon. <laughs> the, just to give you a sense, it's a whole host of things, right? It's resilience money, which can be important for some of the conversation we were just having. Um, grid money, broadband, water, sewer, pipes, all that kind of good stuff, ports. And then the bulk of the money is really at the Department of Transportation for our, um, for our world of programs. Next slide. This is really just to give you a relative sense of how much more money are we talking about in our space. Um, it's sometimes hard to do apples to apples, but this is a pretty close comparison. The current FAST Act, that's our highway and transit bill um, that 
last year was in place, you can see there's a pretty big jump in highways, pretty big jump in transit, huge jump in rail. Some people will see this slide and think, why isn't the rail piece bigger? Why isn't the transit piece bigger? And I hear you. Half of my job is just saying, like, please make that piece bigger. But it is um, shocking to me and in the most exciting way that this piece is as big as it is. I was in this exact piece three years ago and never would have imagined that we would have this much money for rail um, or, and or transit. The fact that they were able to get this passed in a bipartisan way in a very tight Congress, the Senate is 50-50, is unbelievable. So it is um, in no small part due to Senator Warner who sat on the bipartisan group. This was a big priority for him to have this rail money in here. Um, and all of the work of sort of the rail advocates and everyone that, that's been pushing for this for years, Amtrak included. And so this, this is exciting for anybody that says otherwise, like I'll fight you all day. Um, this, is, this is a big deal. And so on the next slide, you'll be able to see um, sort of why it's such a big deal. Can you hit the next slide? Okay, this isn't a DOT slide. So what you can see here is the money that they have been spending on rail since Sorry, small font, 2009. That 2009 money is ARA. That was when we did the, um, the stimulus bill. But the, the blue section in the middle, that's pretty low. That's, that's our normal world of rail funding that goes out the door. Um, it's relatively small. It's mostly for Amtrak. There's some grant money in there that you can sort of barely see starting in 2016, 2017. Um, and then now <laughs> you look at the far end from the red box on. That's the rail money that's new in this bill. A big chunk of that is for Amtrak, and a huge chunk of it is for discretionary grants. Dis discretionary grants we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about today because I think it's one of the biggest opportunities for you all who have done so much work to be at this exact moment in time ready to move on to apply to some of these grants. Um, and then also about how important some of this Amtrak money is. But in addition, there's still work that can be done and there's still sort of more money we can access in the future. So I'll talk about all of those pieces. So next slide. Okay, one big thing to know about this bill is that there is an intense amount of new grant programs. They're across all modes, so highways, transit, there's multimodal programs, there's rail programs. But normally the way that DOT money, I have a slide I'll show you in a little bit. DOT money normally just flows out through formulas and it's set by metrics. Now they have a bunch of new grants. And so if you just look at this screen, everyone that's in blue is a new grant. The two that are in black, build plus raise program and the infra program, those are the existing programs that we had prior to this bill passing. Now there's a whole host of new programs. I flag most of these highways and multimodal grants don't apply to, but it is worth flagging on the next slide that there are two key sort of categories that do apply. The mega projects, the build raise continues, and the infra grant money, those are all have really strong rail eligibilities. They have attempted to fund significant rail projects out of those pots in the past. Mega projects is a new one. Um, so we're sort of gonna have to see how that program comes along, but rail's eligible there as well. And then um, smart grants, that's, uh, if anyone was ever involved in smart city uh, challenge that happened a number of years ago, this is a grant program to continue that, but to make sort of cities come along, but it could have some good overlap with, with the work that you all are doing. Okay, next slide. These are the fun ones. Um, okay, so there is, again, just to point out the difference between the new grants and the old grants, in black are the old grants, the ones we know, Amtrak, NEC, and National Network grants. CRISI, which is rail infrastructure and safety grants that are eligible for both passenger and freight rail systems. And then there's a host of new programs. Oh, I missed CIG, the, the transit program is also continued. But there's a host of new programs, and what I should have just put in gigantic letters is under the federal state partnership, that second one, it says $36 billion. That is so much money for rail. That is. <laughs> astronomical increase in rail funding going out the door and you can almost add up the other programs and um, still be less than than what's going into the fed state partnership program so just going to talk a little bit about the specifics of each of these grants um, and then talk about the process for them so next slide please 
Okay, for CIG, I'm not gonna read these all. I hope that you all have access to these slides, but um, important things to note for, because you guys have a dual project that has both transit and rail, you, there is a significant amount of core capacity money that folks will be able to access through this program, so great that CIG is continued. One of the things I talked about earlier is there's a lot of money in this bill, but there's also access to more money through the appropriations process. The appropriations process is the annual funding bill um, that funds portions of surface transportation. This is one of those programs that could see additional increases as we go through the appropriations process each year. Um, and so while it's a significant increase, it, it is likely to be more um, depending on how many projects go into that pipeline and so getting into that pipeline is critically important just because folks, there's a lot of broad support around getting those projects out the door. Okay, next slide. Say partnership, this is the big one. This is $7.2 billion a year. ARA money for rail, if we look back to that big pot was somewhere around eight. So this is a basically that a year. Um, this is another program. So the Fed State Partnership Program is a program that has existed through the FAST Act. It's not exactly new but they rewrote it significantly enough that it, it feels like a new program, so I marked it in blue. But um, of note, this is where you get new service, improved service, expanded service. This is the growth program for passenger rail. It's also, it doesn't say explicitly high-speed rail, but high-speed rail would be eligible under this program. Um, it is gonna take a big effort by the department to be able to implement the program um, and to get all this money out the door and to make sure that folks are in a position to be able to spend the money. Um, and so they're, they're spending an immense amount of time right now sort of thinking through these steps about how this program will work, what will it cover, um, and how to quickly get people moving on these projects. Next slide. Chrissy, um, I'll, I'll go pretty quickly. And Chrissy, Chrissy is an existing program, does a host, it's, it's a big tent program if you're in the rail space, you're probably eligible under Chrissy. One thing to note in this space, there's new eligibility for innovative rail projects. So thinking through some of your challenges on the resilience front with technology, this is a great space to think about. Could Chrissy money cover some of this? Um, next slide. Crossing elimination program, this is a big new program. This is a lot of complaints um, on the highway side come from um, being stuck, sitting, waiting for trains. A lot of complaints on the passenger side when, when folks are crossing. And so this is an exciting new program that can allow us to remove um, some of those crossing challenges. It's, it has a sort of broader scope. It's called crossing elimination, but there are some other eligibilities when the scope of the program. But this is brand new, so this is another one that will take a little while to get out the door as they work through the specifics. Next slide. Amtrak. All right, everyone's favorite. Um, Amtrak. The two things to note, they broke up the money between the NEC and the National Network, which is typically how we do it. Um, it's about 102, 1.2 billion on the NEC, and it has some pretty focused language around what they should spend the money on, um, including dealing with the backlog on the NEC, um, as well as uh, dealing with some of their service challenges. Next slide. Okay, national network, very similar um, in terms of what the eligibilities are, focus on long distance rolling stock and state supported rolling stock. Importantly, I know everyone's been doing an immense amount of work trying to get new rolling stock procurements um, finished and funded, and so this is an exciting eligibility. ADA has been, I don't have to tell anyone here how long ADA has been going along and the need to um, finish that work at stations. Um, maintenance and then again new technology so opportunities there to think about how can we spend some of that technology money it's also Amtrak shared services sometimes states have flagged challenges with Amtrak on a host of their sort of shared services that everyone accesses um, security and other types of um, funding those are all available under this um, pot of money so I think it's going to be a really exciting time to talk about how this funding goes out the door and really exciting to see the changes that come from its implementation. But one thing to flag, this funding isn't Amtrak's base funding that allows for all the operations. That still goes through the um, normal appropriations process and so Amtrak will need to have significant continued funding every year and so for those of you 
that spend any time talking to anyone in Congress, that's a great opportunity to continue to fund those programs because it is very necessary despite this, these big increases that we see. Um, next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about how the money works. Dis discretionary grants are amazing because it gives lots of people an opportunity to push projects that haven't traditionally had access to transportation funding at the federal level before. It also comes with sort of a world of hurt, which is that everyone is going to be applying for everything and there are so many new programs and each of these programs takes an immense amount of effort to put out the NOFO and the regulations around the program, get applications, write applications, receive and review applications, and then it's the whole process of actually implementing a project. So while this is amazing, it is like sort of jarring for those of us who see how much grant money is about to be flowing. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a hard process for everyone. And so one of the really important things to do is really to start now to identify the key grants where you may be eligible. Virginia is a shining star in the rail space um, and it's that the hard work that you all have done to get here is incredible and so there's a big opportunity to benefit from some of these grant programs. But you know, you might be asking like, which ones should we target and which ones are best for us? And so the best thing that everyone can do is to start thinking about which pots do you fit into? Where do you look most competitively attractive? And then start having conversations with FRA right away. No one should wait to have those conversations because they're thinking through these same challenges. They wanna pick projects that are moving forward and are able to move forward. The fact that you guys work so closely with the freight railroads set you apart from many other projects that don't have that sort of hand in hand at state, local agency, freights, um, Amtrak, so, sort of a unique situation that you all are in. So I think it's a real opportunity. Um, I'll just flag real quickly on the next slide. This is how the bulk of the money goes out the door for the states. It's very easy. It flows um, pretty seamlessly. They, the money goes out um, without a lot of hassle. There are some challenges that might delay some of the funding around the appropriations bill, but, but just generally speaking, the formula funding for this bill, states are gonna have access to that pretty quickly. So whenever you're working with the state on the project, their state funding should, should be available more quickly. On the next slide, you will see, this is a Devin Barnhart potential estimated timeline. This is not, <laughs> no one else signed off on this. Um, but just to give you a sense of how we've looked at grants in the past, formula money, as I was just talking about, the, the kind that flows right to the states, that can go out pretty quickly. That, that can start flowing. The existing grants, any grant that has already existed because they had a regulation, because like Build Tiger, we know how to do those, the NOFOs are essentially written, those can move pretty quickly. New priority grants take a little bit longer. They are prepping them, they're moving really quickly on them, so we expect to see those relatively soon but it does, there is a hold up with approach that does impact some of those programs. So they probably won't be out like in the next couple of months, but hopefully shortly. The last part of programs, there will be programs that just don't come out right away. They're trying to figure out, can they combine programs to get more of them out quickly? But there will be a slog of projects that just don't happen as quickly. As you're thinking about applying for these grants and thinking through, um, what you're eligible for, it's really important to keep in the department objectives. They will say these sort of at every opportunity. The Biden administration has been extremely focused on these objectives. Safety is obviously the number one, it always is for the department. Um, but these other four are, are ones to keep hitting home. I should say transportation of, transformation of our nation's infrastructure is also a pretty typical one, but the equitable economic strength, racial equity and economic inclusion, climate and resilience, these are big picture items this department is very focused on, particularly around equity. The president has an executive order called Justice 40 um, that the department is implementing their piece of, which is when they're looking at um, programs, they're trying to make sure that 40% of the benefit uh, go to areas that are um, economically distressed. And so these can have big impacts on how well you compete and so thinking through when you're thinking about which grants might we apply for, you really wanna focus on sort of where, where are we hitting on these key department objectives and how are we gonna be more competitive within the scope of them. Next slide. Okay, now I'm just gonna jump into a quick couple slides on our polling. 
Unreal did polling. Um, we planned our polling at the beginning of January, right before COVID hit. And so our polling went out, I think, in April that first year, which is made for a real challenge, writing um, and asking people what they thought about transit and rail at that point. And then we did a follow-up this last year and really saw a whole a host of positive feelings. Folks were very, very interested in rail and passenger as it relates to reducing GHG emissions. This is sort of across the board and across generations. Um, so you can see 83%, it's, it's one of our highest polled numbers. Next slide. This, this is the one that, that really surprised us. Last year, this was six out of 10, um, really wanted to come back to rail and transit after the pandemic. This rose to seven out of 10 this year. Um, there is some disparity amongst ages uh, about who's most excited to come back. We were sort of surprised to see some of the, the younger folks were less inclined. They were more focused on Uber and Lyft and those kinds of services. Um, but, but still really strong number of folks who are very interested. So as we're thinking about planning our rail and transit into the future, we know that it's gonna be important to a variety of Americans. Um, next slide. Um, and then the, just the last one, this is one out of two believe that we should be investing more in public transit and passenger rail. This number, you know, can go either way. It's great that 50% of Americans think that we should be doing that. It's also great that we're about to, um, but it, it, it means that we really have a task in front of us of showing what that investment can do. So we'll sort of be watching this number over the years to sort of see how people are feeling about these big investments that we're making and what those projects mean on the ground. All right, I talked for a very long time. I am happy to answer any questions or talk about any of the slides that I put up, but um, super excited to um, brief you all today. Great, thank you. Um, any questions for Devin? I will start, because I have one actually. Um, can you talk a little bit about, just from your um, awareness of some of the other um, work that's happening in other states, um, about the type of competition that, um, as you mentioned before, everybody's gonna be applying for everything, but um, we think we're very well situated, at least, to be able to compete well. Um, but are there other states or other major projects that we will likely be um, competing with that may be on similar time timelines as ours? I mean, sort of depends on which program you're going through, but you know, as we all know, California has spent an immense amount of time, um, very similar, trying to get everyone on the same page, um, has extensive ridership, and this, I'm not speaking specifically about their high-speed rail project, but their, their passenger service, so um, I think California is, is very much eyeing this funding but really this is the most excitement we've seen from across the country. So there's a lot of interest. People did a ton of planning work around the ARA money and then the ARA money was gone. Um, so I think many parts of the country are just picking that piece up. So while I think a lot of folks are interested, I think few are sort of in the space where you guys are, where you have spent all this time prepping and having a very clear vision for what you're building. So I think it is somewhat limited in that sense the competition. Um, I will say there are um, projects in Illinois and other places that have been um, trying to access funding. We've also just seen a really big push from um, some states that we don't normally, Montana, um, and other folks talking about having new service. And I think folks are really excited about what it might mean to have a new map of where expanded service could go. All of that takes time. And so I, I, I just keep pushing people to be like, yes, we should do this big aspirational thinking where it makes sense, but we also should be focused on really getting um, shovels in the ground where we can, and this is clearly a spot where they could do that. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, is, does anybody on the phone um, uh, have any questions? I'm sure I had one quick question. Sure, Rod. Ms. Barnhart, good to see you. Hi, how are you? I am good, I am good. Um, I want you to know your, your comment about the appropriation stuff where the real money comes from. As a former authorizing staffer, I was a little, little bit disappointed. I'm also an authorizing staffer. No, I know, know, I know. I was a little disappointed <laughs> to hear the gusto behind where the real money comes from, quote unquote. But anyway. The cash in hand, Rod. I know, I know. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, authorizing staff still matter. Um, the four, the four broad, uh, not broad, but the four stated objectives in your in your slide, I thought were were particularly noteworthy. 
particularly the piece about safety, obviously, but also about equity. The equity piece seems to be a very big focal point for this administration in dealing with another mode with one of your former Senate Commerce colleagues who's now over at the FAA. They seem to be leaning very forward into the equity inclusion piece. How much of a differentiator do you think that'll be with respect to applic successful applicants? They're writing it in every, into every application already. So in the NOFOs um, that have gone out, on Lono, maybe Chrissy, I'd have to go back and look. They've started writing equity analysis and encouraging an, equi an equity analysis of pro as part of all the projects. Do I think it's gonna be determinative of every project? No, but it is a priority focus. They have a team that's been working on how do we assess this at the department? What does it mean to have those benefits? Um, so they are spending an immense amount of time and they want to see results in that space, so I think it's gonna be a huge priority. Rail. We haven't had, transit is, is, is pretty like an extensive history of talking about equity. We don't talk about that as much in the passenger rail space. And so thinking through what that means in the passenger space, I think is an important component and ensuring that people have access to inner city travel. It's limited, it's limited everywhere with um, aviation losing lines, bus services closing down in some spots. Amtrak is one of the only inner city options they have. And so really thinking through what does this mean for folks in terms of long distance travel is, is critically important. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, sure, it was a good presentation, I appreciate it. The one uh, slide I found a little difficult was 18, the potential timeline. Yeah. I didn't really, it, it's, there are no dates in there. It, 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 it's a little hard to figure yeah. out what you mean and maybe it's because it's so amorphous. But my big issue is, you know, what are we doing? I mean, it, it, what's most important about all this is the opportunity for VPRA and so, is there, what is your plan or, or um, and, you know, what do you see do, doing in the short term and then uh, as it unfolds? So we are already in the, I know um, Sparnhart referred to the, the CIG grants, the capital investment grants that are actually transit grants. We are already in that pipeline. Um, we submitted that back in August and have been accepted by FTA into the pipeline. So it's a, um, it's a very competitive grant program with transit projects competing from all over the country. And it's a multi-year process, so at least a two-year um, process to, to get through, sometimes longer than that. Um, right. We've had some projects in Virginia that may have taken seven years to get through that process. <laughs> but we are in that um, pipeline now, so that is one, um, that's one area where we do expect to compete, um, and I think compete very well. We are, we've been talking I know, quite a bit about having a um, really holistic sort of grant strategy rather than just trying to apply for everything that's out there all the time, but really trying to put together a federal funding strategy that we could then bring to okay. DOT and talk with them about, you know, here's the type of um, level of participation that we hope to see uh, from federal grants in this. and. Um, you know, these are the types of programs that we would expect to go after, but also to get some feedback from them on that too. And they've, they've really encouraged us and welcomed um, that. I know I've, I've spoken with the FRA administrator about it and he, he, they're ready for us to come in with that kind of strategy. They are, um, as Devin mentioned, they're looking for feedback as well from the states and the, the potential applicants. They really want, as they are struggling to put together this program, they are um, very interested in hearing from all of us about um, project development timelines, um, things that um, sort of how we see things going on our end, but we are, um, I think, pretty far ahead of a lot of other states because we have, I can't emphasize en enough the importance of the arrangements that we've already negotiated with Norfolk Southern and with CSX. Um, many of the, um, Amtrak I know has some pretty big, um, plans as well with um, lines all over the map. Um, but in many cases, they don't have um, host railroad agreements already for those. And so um, that will, I think, help us quite a bit as, as well. So. We'll say when I give this presentation to anyone that isn't you all, the fourth and fifth slides are your project and then the <laughs> partners in your project because it's so rare to have that lineup of partners holding hands um, and having already secured a deal. It is. Uh, pretty unique, and when I say pretty, it is, it, it is just unique. Um, one thing on the timelines, like you and me both, 
I wish there were dates. One thing to, to think about for grants is, in the past, the way the department has done it is, they've put up NOFOs sort of when they wanted to, um, and they made decisions when they wanted to, and it didn't really have a rhyme or reason. It wasn't like it was happening every March, a certain grant was coming out. Um, so that's been a real challenge with the existing grants. Now that they have dozens of grants that they have to put out the door, encouraging the department to have a transparent process for folks is really important. It costs a lot of money to apply to these grants um, and a lot of work to get them to good shape. So yes, it would be great to have some dates around those. The only good news is, um, not the only good news, part of the good news is there's multiple years of this grant. All of these grants happen over the course of the next five years. There'll be multiple cycles. Um, and so just thinking through, maybe this isn't a project that happens in the next, maybe we're not ready to apply in the next six months. Maybe we're gonna work with the sure. department and apply next year. Sure. The one caveat to think through, which I did not put in these slides, but is always ever present, and as many of you in, worked in DC know, politics is a thing. Um, the House is likely to flip to Republicans. The Senate is up in the air, but leaning Republican potentially. Um, the administration has a few years left, but that, that we will be in cycle there too. And so thinking through which projects are important to this administration and this Congress is important to do on the front end as well and to add that lens to how you prepare your grant applications. Well, Madam Chair, I would just say based on what you, you said, um, and we've certainly teed it up so well with the branding, the VDOT, uh, all of our partners, VDOT, top of the list, and DRPT and, and the vision. So I would think a, a strategic you know, plan for federal funding would be a good thing. And I say that partly because we have a new administration here and a new VDOT leadership coming in so that, that packaging it and making sure we continue moving forward and being as clear as possible about that strategy, I think can only help. So it sounds like a good idea. Yeah, and I, I can say as well that um, the, I, I had a conversation with the incoming governor's chief of staff and um, they are putting together a task force of um, of people, I'm not quite sure who's gonna be on that task force, but um, specifically designed to look at um, funding opportunities under this bill and, and so. to figure out how Virginia across the board can compete for um, federal grants, so. It'd be a good thing, yeah. Yep. Any other questions? I don't know, DJ, if you had anything to add about federal grants or. Uh, I, I just wanna add to that, we're gonna be very aggressive. I mean, we see this as a fantastic opportunity, as I think the whole board knows, we're acqu acquiring railroads, and, and some of them are in better shape than others but to the extent that we can use this federal money as an opportunity to increase our safety, whether they're old bridges or tunnels, we are going to be very proactive in doing that. Everything from ADA at stations to, again, bridge safety, we're looking for opportunities to move some of those phase three and four projects forward so we can address this quickly. It, one other question I had, has there, um, was there anything related to the, um, federal match um, rate associated with CIG grants that, and again, the CIG grant is the grant that we're in the pipeline for, that typically um, FTA, I think is, um, typically gives in the neighborhood of about a 30%, 30 to 40% federal match, but I don't know if there's anything in the bill that changed that. It's entirely possible. I will say it's 2,000 plus page bill, but NCIG grants is not where I spend the host of my time, but um, I can definitely look and get back to you, but okay. not that I know about hand. I'm sorry, I got something else to add. Is there any way to partner with another state that gives you a benefit like Tennessee or North Carolina? You should mention that. We actually, <laughs> um, we are partnering with North Carolina DOT on a grant application um, right now. Um, it's related to uh, advancing planning on the S line. Um, which is the line between Petersburg that we own from Petersburg to Ridgeway, North Carolina, and NCDOT is working with CSX on the portion in, um, uh, that extends to Raleigh right now. Um, we have had some conversations, I see Emily Stock in the room here, um, with our counterparts in Tennessee as well about potentially looking at um, rail service through Bristol. Um, there's a lot of interest in the state um, potentially to expand Passenger Rail to Bristol, Emily will be talking in a little bit about the General Assembly study that we did. Um, however, it really would make sense to have it be part of a more long distance line that connects into um, other destinations south, rather than just going from Bristol north. So 
we are um, in conversations with them too. But I think especially the opportunities with North Carolina um, yeah. are going to be significant. I just know that kind of partnership just usually really throws, is appealing. Yep, uh, When you can go beyond your borders. It, right. it traditionally has been a selling point for grants that have been selected in ARA. You'll remember um, some of the biggest grants were sort of uh, multi-state freight uh -huh. um, capacity that was added. So they can be really compelling because you get so many political supporters um, can add a, a real uh, like sort of heavy weight to, to the application process. That being said, it doesn't always make sense for your individual project. So it's, it's really aligning your immediate goals, your long-term goals with the metrics and what makes you most competitive. But it, it is one of those things that can make you competitive. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, Ms. Barnard, well, thank you. Good, good to see luck. You. I'm looking forward to seeing it, and I will be riding. So thanks. Great. <laughs> thanks. Okay. So just doing a time check. Um, so our next item on the agenda is actually our FY22 budget amendment, as well as presentation on the FY23 budget. Um, I want to thank the other members of the finance committee that were present this morning. We actually got a, um, had the opportunity to get this presentation as well. Um, as we noted, we were originally planning to do our finance committee meeting in December, um, but then we knew the bu governor's budget would be coming out in mid-December with new revenue or information. Um, well, then we were planning to have our finance committee meeting last week, but um, with the snow, we had to cancel it. And so we were able to meet this morning um, and uh, Steve and Shannon are going to um, go through the, um, both the components of the amended budget as well as the FY23 budget. Steve? Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so before I jump in, I just do want to say that there was a lot of work that went into these two budgets. Um, Shannon did a lot of work, uh, was very helpful to me, but then also the whole department, uh, this wasn't just Shannon and I doing this work, it involved the whole department. And the point of the amendment and obviously a budget is one to provide y'all good feedback on the progress that we're making within the agency on the efforts that you uh, told us to go forth with. So I just wanted to say that before I jump into the slide. So next slide, please. For this slide, I'm not going to read all that. It's really just here for y'all's information. It basically says if you're wondering why we're here, in early January looking at our budget and not later uh, a couple of months from now but essentially we have to prepare a budget and present that budget to the Commonwealth Transportation Board who is a big funding partner towards a lot of the projects that uh, we are carrying out so by February 1 of each year uh, we have to recommend a budget forward to them and that's uh, why we're here today next slide slide is really uh, just an overview of the purpose of the budget I'm not going to read that again but uh, the classifications I do want to talk for a moment about those because uh, as you're looking through the budget document you'll see that it's compartmentalized into three separate areas one is our operations budget which is you know our general administrative cost but more importantly the cost to actually run the passenger service which is the core of the purpose of our authority. The second uh, classification is capital projects. And on capital projects, the key differentiator here is it's sort of a financial accounting uh, perspective is projects that are our projects. And at the end of the day, we will own the underlying asset related to the project. And going forward, we'll have to maintain those assets. And then finally, the third uh, sort of section of the budget is our capital and operating grants and this is where we have an outside partner that's going to carry out the work and they're going to do that work on assets that they will own at the end of the project next slide please i didn't say this but at any point please feel free if you have questions as we're talking uh, we're both comfortable with, with the questions as we're moving forward so before I let Shannon take over and take you through capital projects and the capital and operating grants, 
sections of these uh, budgets. I just want to give a real high level of what we're doing. Um, we are looking to amend the FY22 budget, which is the year we're in currently. And it's not something, it's, we're, it's not something that will be a commonplace event. Um, it's a one-time event for us for three real reasons in my mind. One, um, Western Rail Initiative, we had briefed y'all on that back last spring, but because we did not know for certain uh, that the deal with NS was gonna push through, had, had, was not incorporated into the budget at that time. So the approved FY22 budget does not have that large initiative, which in the next two to three months, we will need to make significant expenditure for. Next item uh, is we did, uh, in working through our financial statement audit, we reported our operations, our revenues, and our expenditures on a gross methodology, meaning we showed both of them, whereas before when we did the budget last December, we kind of mirrored what DRPT had been doing for years, which was just utilizing the net expenditure amount. And I do think it's very important for this new classification at a gross level because it does show a lot better information with respect to those core operations. <clears throat> and then the third thing I wanted to point out here is as you're looking through these slides and Shannon's talking you through uh, the bud capital projects and the capital grants. You know, I think we tried to make these slides point out to y'all where we had new projects. So anything new where you're authorizing new funding, you're adding funding to an existing project. But then also the third thing was wherever there was a project and for whatever reason we may have removed the project or the project budget has decreased. And those, as opposed to focusing on one year of expenditure on these capital items, I'm trying to tee up to focus on the total capital budget and the total capital grant budget. Um, and I think those three items would be important. So in looking at that, when compare the FY22 budget amendment and then we move to the FY23 proposed budget that will be hopefully recommended forward to the CTD when we meet again at the end of, or beginning of February. I think the only thing you gotta focus on is the, the total capital projects, the total capital grants budget are the same in both documents. All we're doing, and it's why there's this red box, all we're doing for 23 is we're showing another year of expenditure. So we're showing the FY28 year of timing of expense um, is, is the only change between the two. With that, I am going to, if you have any questions for me, otherwise I'm going to hand it over to Shannon to take you through the first couple of sections. Alrighty, let's go ahead and jump in. We're going to be starting with capital projects here. As Steve mentioned, we're trying to create the budget so it really mirrors a financial statement. So capital projects are going to eventually end up on the balance sheet as fixed assets. So these are going to be assets that we own at the end of the completion, and we're going to be tasked with doing the maintenance on them for their useful lives. So that's really what's defining a capital project in this section. There's two key programs within the capital project section, and we're going to kick ourselves off with the I-95 corridor program on the next slide here. So here you'll see the total changes that we're going to have between the approved and the amended budget. This total budget, as Steve has mentioned, is going to be the same for both the FY22 amendment and the 23 budget. It's going to include all project expenditures for all years. Um, and we're going to talk through these a little bit more in detail down below, but we really just wanted to drive home that it's going to be the same total budget for each of these when we're talking about both the approved, I mean the amended and the FY23 budget. So let's go ahead and press on. So we're going to dive into each of the changes here. So the first call out here is in green. So all of these projects, these four projects, the costs here have been updated to align with the executed CRA that was signed with CSX. We'll dive into them a little bit. So Long Bridge, 
The plan construction for this was really designed to ramp up in 25 and 26 in the approved budget, but now that's shifted out to 28 and 29. The increase you'll see here is related to the time value of money with that shifting out of that project. Next is the Alexandria 4 track, and this here, this increase relates to additional right of way that will need to be acquired for this project. Franconia to Lorton, and then the Franconia to Springfield bypass. The shift here is just a delineation of each of the projects, so there's actually been some cost shifted over to the Franconia to Lorton project. However, between the two, there's a net great decrease of $54 million, so a net positive there. So all of these have just been updated to align with what's in the CRA, because that's the budget we'll be managing to on a going forward basis. <coughs> Next in the, the red call out here, we've got the TR TRV right of way transaction costs. So as you know, we've been inquire, incurring these since the transaction's really been going on. We're gonna put them in the budget now so we can manage towards them. So there's a lot of costs that we were not really aware of in the onset when the budget was presented last year. So we have titling, legal assistance, and survey work that's been going on. So at this point, we'd like to put it in the budget so we can continue to track it. The last item on this page relates to the gross up of the Newington and Route 1 bridges. So in the initial budget, we just included the, the VPRA portion of this. So there's actually an additional amount that was coming from funding partners. As we're gonna be capitalizing the whole total project cost, we'd like to put the total project cost in the budget. We've also included the revenue sources for this as well. So really these increase are just a gross up of the budget with a minor increase in the Route 1 bridge budget. On the next page, we'll continue on to talk about the remaining changes that we're gonna be putting through in the amendment. So the first item here goes back to that reclassification that we were talking about, trying to put budget items in the right bucket. So here we have the Amtrak new equipment, which has been moved over to a capital and operating grant. These train sets are gonna be purchased when new service comes online, but we aren't gonna be retaining these assets. They're just gonna be going to Amtrak, they will own it. So it's not really a capital project, it really equates to a grant. So it's been reclassified out of this section. Next, we have the Richmond layover facility, which is a required project in order to meet the schedule defined in the executed CRA, so it's been included in the budget as well. Or into Route 1, so this would really be a Phase 3 or Phase 4 project, but when thinking about the corridor, so when you go from Franconia to Lorton, it's three tracks, and then this Lorton to Route 1 is this 1.2 miles, it drops down to two tracks. And then at the Route 1 bridge, it drops back, it goes back up to four, so you have this, this bottleneck that's existing, so what we've decided is, since we have the funding available, we are gonna push this project into phase one and phase two in order to have corridor development efficiencies and long-term cost savings because we'll be able to do the whole stretch in one pass. Um, and then the last section here, the other I-95 corridor projects, this is what Jennifer was talking about. So this is the FCA core capacity grant that we have an application in for. Here's some additional costs related to both Long Bridge and Alexandria Fort Track that we're gonna need to incur to further that eligibility, so we've included that in the budget as well. It's a separate cost, so we are able to track that a little bit differently. Before I move off of the total I-95 corridor budget, can I answer any questions on these changes? Any questions from anybody on the phone? Okay. All right, we'll move on to the other big corridor. So we've got the Western Rail Corridor that we'll be adding in to the FY22 amendment on the next slide here. There we go. Awesome, so these are the capital project section of the Western Rail Corridor. There's also capital grants. If you go to page seven of your FY23 budget, you'll see an inclusive list of what the total Western Rail Corridor looks like. This is just gonna be the capital project section of it. So again, uh, the amended 22 is the same as 23, including all project expenditures for all years. So we've got the right of way acquisition, the new platform and track that will need to be put in place, and then some condition items that are capital improvements that we've determined that we need to do on the line. And then we've learned that we need to include transaction costs, so that's been included <coughs> as well. So anything else that I, I know there's gonna be further discussion on this later, so I'm happy to answer any questions on this now or we can proceed in the presentation. Question, <coughs> question. for the New River Valley platform and track, are there also costs for other infrastructure, parking, yes. facilities? Something right, like so that. the V-Line tunnels, capital improvement bridges, and capital improvements other, it's all capital improvements that are gonna be required on the Virginia line that we're purchasing. So due to various survey work that we've done, um, we've realized that there's gonna be some initial infrastructure needs that are gonna be required once we purchase the asset. And if you have more specifics, Mike is behind me, ready to jump in as well. He can answer some of these questions. So with regard to New River Valley, I do wanna state that we're going, undergoing a NEPA evaluation. We have four sites currently under evaluation. Some of those, I think I heard you mention parking, I couldn't hear 
for productive. Yes, parking. One of the locations at the New River Valley Mall would have parking pretty much already there because there's the mall parking. It's an idea of one way to reinvent the mall. We'd have to work with the mall to make sure there's still adequate parking for the customers at the mall. So that, that there would be less parking and road needs at that location. However, some of the other locations would need more parking and road needs. So there's, there's four alternatives. Happy to, uh, we'll send out to the board um, a survey we have going on for the New River Valley. Um, we've already received 2,500 comments as of this morning um, from, from, from various, from the public and other stakeholders. So, so that, that, that number is a placeholder for now until we determine the exact site. That is, is based on one of the options though. Um, and we'll be further refining that as we move forward. I, I'd rather have that option uh, be whittled down, if you will, budgetary wise and otherwise. Um, but that is a, a number that we've gotten uh, preliminarily from our consultants. We're gonna continue to refine that as the projects move forward. Thank and just you. Pretty avoidance of doubt, we're in the middle of a feasibility study that's looking at the four different locations that Mike talked about. Um, we're also doing a public survey where we're getting comments from the public. Sometime in the February mm -hmm. um, calendar, we'll be having a public meeting to go over what we found and to get additional comment. We probably will not have a final recommendation on station location. Well, we, we definitely won't until after February. Um, at that point, when we decide which station, when we have, have all of those facts in line, when we make the recommendation on which station location we'll go with, we'll know whether money goes to parking or to roads or to environmental work. There's a lot of drainage issues that come to the station. So it, it, it's more info to come, unfortunately. Thank you. The, um, sorry to belabor this point, but the one thing that um, we also expect that there will be a local um, contribution towards the funding station or towards the funding for the station in the New River Valley. Um, there is a New River Valley um, passenger station authority that was created in the last General Assembly session. Um, they are made up of all of the um, uh, local governments in that area, but um, they are expecting and they know that, that we will be um, looking for and working with them on a local contribution. Okay. Thank you for raising that. That's an important point. At, at, the, at, two, at three of the four locations, there's a trail that runs alongside, right, alongside all the locations. It's a very popular trail that connects Black, Blacksburg and Christiansburg. Um, and we're not harming the trail. We might have to work with it to, to fit the, the station and some of the, some of the track in. That's a very important point. Um, it's also a pedestrian overpass to other, it's a, it's a neighborhood that is growing to the west of the New River Valley Mall that we wanna make sure that people don't have to drive a mile to where the crow flies 400 yards. Um, so that's very important station access to, as to us, not just by car, but by bike walking is very, very important to us. So that is part of the survey com and feasibility component to make sure that that is included. Uh, but also the New River Valley has asked that if we build a station, that we, um, that would the station be built in coordination with them because they want to put some offices there. We think it's a great opportunity to have some, some, some place making, if you will, to allow for, when you're building something new, allow for the New River Valley or the area to have some place to have public meetings and or New River Valley Station Authority would like to have their offices there at the New River Valley Station, which would make a lot of sense. So, great. Thank you. Excuse me. Does that, does that choice come to the board to decide? Or the choice no? comes to the board. We'll be working with the board. Uh, we're all of us work with the Federal Railroad Administration as part of the federal NEPA action. Uh, we'll continue to keep you informed. Yeah, but the question. board, I don't know the answer with to the, it. Regard the budget process, Director Fassett, we'll. I think that's something we'll have to look into. The, um, I know when we have had, um, I don't, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think the CTB tends to approve um, locally preferred alternatives for the NEPA process when they when when we do that. I know there have been times with DC to RVA, we actually did bring the record of decision to the board because we wanted CTB approval um, on that. But um, I don't know, Michael, if you had seen other practice at, at VDOT. Uh, so that's, that's a really good question. The, for sure, any contract that would be let would have to come to the board. But you're asking specifically about site location. As I sit here today, I can say I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I mean, it might be good to know if the decision, if, if it's a recommendation of staff to the board or if it's not, or we're just being informed, uh, you know, to ask questions about it. I don't know. I, I will point out that the decision will not be made without the full understanding of the board. I mean, we'll bring all of the data on all four locations to the board. It may be uh, 
an outcome where there's one that is clearly the right, right path. Right. But a lot of it depends on the locality and, and yeah. what funding comes. You know, Christiansburg, for example, may be willing to fund a significant amount if the station's sure. at the mall and nothing if it's at the Essex location. So that, that's helpful and it'll be helpful to know who ultimately is responsible because some of those questions, you know, things that funnel up through the public comment, you know, the ac access to the station that you were referring to are all interesting things that I think we at, at a minimum have an ability to follow up on. I, I also think that the public, if there's a station location that they want that doesn't come to fruition, they'll be reaching out to everybody around this table saying, hey, why not this one? So that w you, yeah. you won't be left in the dark. We're, we're not inviting that. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, well that's going to round us out on the total capital project budget, but now we're going to kind of zoom in and look at the actual annual expenditures here. So we're going to look at this from two different lenses. The first one is we're going to compare the amended 22 budget to the 23 budget for annual spend. So you'll notice here that there's actually going to be a $27 million decrease year over year. Don't worry, the projects are still ramping up. The main driver of this decrease is that we're acquiring more right-of-way acquisitions in FY22, which are not occurring in FY23, causing that decrease. We do expect a large ramp up of about $73 million in the I-95 corridor projects and $29 million in the Western Rail corridor projects. Um, the lower half of the slide, you're gonna see an, a, a comparison between the amended FY22 budget annual expenditures versus the approved FY22 budget annual expenditures. What we'd like to call out here is you can really see that shift out of Long Bridge. So that initial construction occurring in 25 and 26, you can see in that blue, has now shifted out to about 27. If you continued it on, you'd see that ramp up there. So that's just the annual expenditure comparison. Last slide in this section, we are gonna talk about how all these capital projects are going to be funded. So if we go to the next slide here. so. How are we going to fund this $4.1 billion budget? So the big funding sources here, we've got the I-66 inside the Beltway toll funding, VPRA revenues, Amtrak capital contribution, and the CTB allocated. So CTB allocated, this is going to be sources such as PTF, SmartScale, CMAP, and then I-81 revenues. This number has increased by about $155 million based on allocated funds specifically for the Western Rail Corridor, which have been incorporated into the budget. The other item here that we'd like to talk about is the I-66 inside the Beltway toll funding. So this revenue source in total has decreased about $270 million. The reason for that is the, the last study that really kind of for, uh, forecasted the revenues was done in 2019 pre-pandemic. So now we're working with actuals at this current time. And obviously, well, some of the traffic patterns have returned, the time frame of the traffic patterns is not creating the revenues it once did for that corridor. So we have taken a haircut on this based on our best available data, knowing that there's a lot of uncertainty that goes with this. So is it that we're gonna have another variant that comes out and continues to push everybody home? Will the federal, like, will federal workers be required to go back to work or are they gonna work from home? So we just don't really know what's gonna happen with this funding source. So we wanted to take a conservative approach, put this plan, align it with the estimates and go ahead and see where we stood as a total funding picture. Luckily with this, the VPRA revenues have had an uptick, so we've been able to fill that shortfall with those revenues there. The last thing I want to point out before we move off this slide is there's going to be three different financing that are going to happen in order to fund these projects. So like I just mentioned, the I-66 inside the Beltway toll funding, that's going to be led by VDOT and the CTB. And then we have the VRE CROC funding, which is going to happen in the next quarter or so, and that's going to be led by VRE. And then we have our financing on the passenger tickets ticket revenues, and that's going to happen with us VPRA-led in about 2025. That's going to round us out for the capital projects budgets. I'm happy to pause and answer any questions before we move on. Questions? Anybody on the phone? Okay. okay. Capital, capital and operating grants. Mm -hmm. So going back to our financial statement comparison, so capital and operating grants are going to hit the income statement. However, they're not part of our core operations, so it would just be an other expense. The key differentiator is here is that we're going to be giving money to a third party to either improve their capital assets or operate some sort of railroad function, but we aren't going to be doing, we're not the ones that are actually performing those, those projects. So we're kind of just the pass through for these funds. We're administering the funds. So if we go to the next slide here, you'll see we've got a total of 29 grants that we are going to be administering. 24 of them are done by the VPRA staff and five of them will be done by DRPT. Um, 
And we'll talk about the differentiator there in a second, but some of the key drivers for the changes in the, v in, in the funding for grants is gonna be changes in grantee project scope, the CTB grant awards, budget reclassifications like we talked about before, new or removed VPRA grants or updated project costs related to VPRA grants. The big change you're gonna see here is that we've got VPRA grant funding, so not total project funding. So if you were to go look at Crystal City Platform and VRE's budget, it's obviously gonna be more than $700,000. We are contributing a portion of that, so that's what we're demonstrating here is the change in our portion. What are we administering? And that's what we're gonna be looking at as far as the change between the approved and then the amended budgets. Last thing to note before we move off the slide is 33% of our grants are going to be CTB allocated, meaning the grantee is going to CTB, putting in their application for what they're going to do, and then the CTB awards it. VPRA was tasked with administering it after the fact, after it's been awarded. So we, most 30% of these are actually being passed on to us from the CTB. You can go to the next slide. So with our new classification of VPRA managed and DRPT managed, you'll kind of see that breakout on this slide here. DRPT managed were not in the budget in the prior year. DRPT has retained five grants in accordance with the board approved MOA. We would like to include them in the current year because the cash, the cash flow for these is gonna be coming out of VPRA funds. In order for us to better cash manage our investments, we need to know what's going on with the annual expenditures for these. Also, if these projects don't proceed with the grantee, the funding will come back to the VPRA for us to be able to re reallocate to our projects. So, Keeping, a, keeping these in our budget will help us manage these more actively going forward. Before we leave the slide, I wanna draw everyone's eye to the, the total change here of $129 million. We've created a slide that really summarizes this. For 29 grants, it's hard to kinda of talk about each one individually, but we're gonna kinda of put it in like a bigger picture so you can see really what's moving here and what the important changes are. So if we go to the next slide, I'll talk us through that. So. Starting out here, the top of this table is gonna show the new grants or funding changes to the grants. So the first section is VRE scope changes or new CTB grants. So this entire bucket shows that VRE had a decrease of $31 million related to the grants. A lot of this was due to changes in scope. We did the I-95 corridor, they didn't need to do a platform on one side because now they have a railroad there. So a lot of it was just them kind of changing their scope and adjusting to the new corridor that we have going on. And then they have also been awarded a couple new grants as well. That covers off on that first one though, and that's all the VRE changes. The next four we would really consider to be VPRA grants. These are our grants being funded with our funds. So we've got the Ettrick Station State of Good Repair, Station Program and Planning, Positive Train Control, and then the S-Line Planning and Development. So Ettrick Station and the Positive Train Control, these have been updated just because we now have better idea what the costs are gonna be. Positive Train, train Control has been completed, we know where that's gonna land. Ettrick Station, I will note, we do have a Christie grant out there, an application to receive funds in order to help us with this cost increase. We don't know if we have it at this point, so it's not been included as a source, but we are seeking funding to assist us with those, those um, repairs on that station. Station pl program and planning, the cr increase there just relates to our continued commitment to work on state of good repair on our stations. The next section that we've called out is the Western Rail Corridor. So these are the two new grants that will be going into our budget related to the Western Rail Corridor. So we've got the Western Rail Initiative Grant and the Roanoke Yard Improvements, both going to Norfolk Southern here. Last, DRPD Manage is added as a new grant. Even though they were existing last year, we're gonna put them in the budget this year. Next section, we've got the Removed or Reclassified. You'll see that Amtrak train equipment probably looks familiar from Capital Projects, though the number has changed. It was $55 million up in Capital Projects. It's now coming here as $34 million. Again, we have a much better understanding of how much this is gonna cost, and we've moved it to the correct section of the budget. The two next grants to Norfolk Southern have been removed as the Western Rail Corridor is gonna be taking place and that transaction is gonna occur. These capital grants are gonna fall off the budget and will no longer be going out the door. And the last item here, we've got our very track lease payment re related to CSX. So in accordance with the JOMA that was signed with CSX, this payment is actually gonna be for maintenance on our corridor, meaning it's more of an operations expense because it's gonna be paying for all of the maintenance that we need to do. So it's been reclassified as well to operations. This is gonna drop us down to a $129 million change here. Can I answer any questions on the changes? I know this is kind of a lot to bite off. Okay. Wonderful. We can proceed on to the funding for this then, that's great. So on the next slide, 
you'll see that we have that the, our pie chart of the 30% of VPRA, I mean CTB allocated grants, and then we have the CTB allocated VPRA. So I want to note that these, again, are funds that the CTB has allocated to VPRA for Western Rail. So we've carved that out as well. You'll see in the table some of the sources for this. So similar to the other CTB allocations, so the grants get CMAC, there's I-66 outside the Beltway concessions and smart scale for CTB allocated grants, and then the, the CTB allocated monies coming to us relate to the 2020 Appropriations Act, Smart Scale, I-81 Corridor Improvement Program, and then everything else is being funded with VPRA funds. And then to our last slide, so that we are mirroring capital projects as well, so here's the comparison between the amended and the approved annual expenditures. You're really gonna see, I mean, pretty much everything is gonna be very consistent. 23 had a really big uptick. A big driver of this is the $26 million payment that's going out the door related to the Western Rail Initiative grant. And then also when we sourced all of the, the cash flow expenditure forecasts from our grantees, they expect a big year in 23. So a lot of this is coming from the grantees and their expected expenditures in FY23. So that is gonna round us out for capital and operating grants. Can I answer any questions on this section before we, okay, Jay? Oh, yeah, I have a question. Um, I noticed in, in several of the slides there is money in here from the inside the Beltway tolling, which I was involved with at the time. I see money from the outside the Beltway 66, this is all about 66, tolling. What about I-95 tolling? We, um, so as you know, there's, on the Hot Lanes project, there is funding that's going to NVTC for transit improvements. Um, we are not, um, at this point in time, planning to, to tap into any of those funds. Um, I know VRE is also eligible uh, for those as well, but I, primarily right now, those funds are being used for um, commuter bus um, and transit uh, improvements. Okay, so it, it, we're not precluded at any point in the future from tapping into it, but at the moment, there are other priorities that those tolling revenues are being Yep. Uh, allocated to. They're being allocated by NVTC today. Um, we do have funding in here from um, the Fredericksburg extension of the hot lanes. Um, there was a concession payment that w um, was made by Transurban to the state and for, for transportation purposes in the corridor. So we are planning to use, um, I forget how much, is it 200 million from that, Steve? 255. What's that? 255. 255. Um, that is generated by the, um, the Fredericksburg extension of the hot lanes. I don't actually remember, but the 95 tolling, is that an ongoing percentage or was that a one-time payment? For the, um, well, there's different components of the 95, but there's, um, it is an ongoing payment the, for the 395, 95, 395 um, inside the Beltway portion is a recurring uh, transit payment from um, the concessionaire. The money that is related to the um, Fredericksburg extension is a one-time um, payment. So I don't, Michael knows Yeah, it. These. You said it perfectly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think Steve's gonna pick back up and walk through operations now. So next slide, please uh, take a few minutes and take y'all through the operations format. But maybe before I start, I wasn't sure about the time, uh, like as far as a break, Jennifer, I didn't know if. Um, what I was gonna propose is that we continue um, and go ahead and, and get through these budget slides um, and, then and then break for lunch. Um, and then we'll have a few items um, as, as well after that. So. Um, on this slide, it's really, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, budget, the two different budgets you're gonna be looking at. And the, the main thing, and I mentioned this earlier, the, one of the big drivers for doing an amendment was we wanted to show our operational budget instead of showing it just the net cost that we paid to Amtrak or the net subsidy amount. We wanted to show the actual revenues coming in and then all the different expenditures and I think as I go through this, you'll see the big reason for that is one, it gives us a lot better data when we're looking at each of our different trains and our different routes to analyze how each of those are doing. And then two, um, as Shannon mentioned in fiscal year 25 or thereabouts, 
we're looking to take this revenue stream of passenger ticket revenues and actually go out and bond against that to provide funding um, to do some of our capital projects at that point in time. So obviously we need to show those revenues in our financial records uh, to be able to go out to the open market and issue debt against it. Second thing here is, and, and Shannon's mentioned this several times, there are several reclasses amongst the three different categories of budgets. Um, Apologize for that. I think we've come up with a good standard this year. I think we talked about this back in September um, to the board and to the finance committee. I think we now have a good standard and going forward we won't have those reclasses. I know it makes this presentation a little confusing. And the third item here that uh, what as a board member for y'all to be thinking about as we move forward, we have at the very bottom an overall cost recovery metric. And what this actually is for all of our operational costs, including our general administrative expenses. And I think for, for now, uh, we want to propose this as a metric as we move forward, but for now, we obviously don't know is, you know, the 51% that the FY23 budget is showing, is that a, a good number or a bad number? And uh, as DJ pointed out earlier in the finance committee meeting, um, you know, we're going to always strive to do better. I don't think anyone here can reasonably expect that we're going to get close to 100%. Um, and I said this earlier, all of our, all of our transportation, you know, roads, airports, it, transit, et cetera, they're all subsidized. So we're going to have some subsidy level, but to me, I think we've determined internally that a good metric for y'all to, to look at our performance on how well we're managing our operations is this cost recovery metric. Next slide, please. So first, I, I want to try to walk y'all through the F, amended FY22 uh, budget. And I think what, what I'm trying to do with these two slides is bridge that gap of the old net presentation to the new gross presentation, because I just can't take the FY22 approved budget and put it up against the FY23 or the FY22 amended budget because FY23 approved was just as net expenditures. So the point of these two charts is to one, show you the amended budget with all the gross level detail, the revenues, all the detailed expenses. As you see, the new budget comes down in the red box to an $18.1 million planned subsidy amount. And then when we shift back to the chart on the left, you'll see the approved FY22 budget had a $51.2 million net cost. And we're comparing that to our 18.1 and our amended, proposed amended budget. And you see it's a $33 million decrease that we're coming back uh, in our amended budget for FY22. The reasons for those for that decrease are listed below. We had some new service that we thought was going to start in FY22. We now know it won't. So that was about $8.2 million of the decrease. $10.3 million of the decrease was federal credits that have been applied by Amtrak before they ever the bill ever comes to us that therefore have reduced the cost. We knew there was federal stimulus funds out there, I mean not stimulus, but relief funds out there. At, when we did the budget last year, we did not know the, how they were gonna be allocated, so we did not include them. So that's 10.3 million of costs that are being covered by outside funds. Um, in addition, the Richmond service that we had in the budget for the full year, it did not return back to service until late in September. So there's three months of cost there. And then finally, the other, the other factor that's uh, playing into the decrease is we were very conservative in our estimate of revenues due to the uncertainty of the pandemic. Before I move on, are there any questions on that? Questions from anybody on the phone? Okay, keep going, Steve. So next slide, please. 
So the FY22 administrative budget, uh, the approved compared to the amended, you see a $1.47 million increase. And a lot of this increase, uh, not quite half, but maybe a little over a third is payroll. And that is we are, it's, when we developed the budget December of 2020, we thought 28 employees. Right now, we believe we'll have 34 employees by the end of the year. So that's uh, part of the cost. Additionally, the other large driver here is professional services, which professional services, uh, as I said earlier in the finance committee, when we started, we literally had no infrastructure in this entity at all. We had no general ledger, um, no process, no procedures. So, and we literally, first day there was three employees. So we've needed to rely, while we're ramping up our employment level, we've needed to rely on a little more on some consultant support. And as you've heard earlier, there's a lot of federal money out there and we're using some of that support to help us with applications for that federal financial assistance. And the third item that's noted here is the ERP system implementation. And there's just a slight increase related to that. And it's also, we've had to ramp up a little quicker because we do have more employees. And so um, some additional needs for IT because of those employees. Next slide, please. The FY23 budget is here, shown here. And here I'm going to compare it to that amended budget. So we're, not, we're no longer dealing with that gross versus a net comparison. So on the right here, you see what we're proposing for the amendment with the $18.1 million additional funding required. And then the 23 budget, we're looking at 60 million, which is a $41.9 million increase. What the key factors in that increase are those two trains that we thought were gonna start in FY22, now they're gonna start this summer, so it's FY23. And if you take our FY22 budget for the six trains that currently exist, the expenditures, you divide it by six, you come out to about $12.4 million per train, two new trains, that's the $25 million. In addition, we have some costs related to the Western Rail Initiative, some access fees and some maintenance costs that are new. Our administrative expenses, 22 to 23, are, are gonna increase, and I'll go into that later. Those federal credits that help keep costs down in 22. Instead of 10.3 million in 22, we only have 4.4 million in 23. So that's, it, it, it basically in turn increases our costs that we have to cover. Those are the main drivers in the, uh, in the increase from 22 to 23 that we're proposing. And once again, I will ask if there's questions before I move on. Questions? All right, okay. next slide. This is to take you through the detail of the administrative budget. And for the most part, it's year over year. There's not a lot of change. I mean, there's two, two items that have some change to, to take y'all through. One is our payroll and benefits. And FY22, we started the year with, it's, four employees or maybe five, I just don't remember the start date of one employee. So in the budget, we were starting with four for 22. When you look at 23, we're planning to start FY22, 23, mind you, with 34 employees. So a very significant change in the number of employees that are gonna be on payroll for the full year. There's still a ramp up going from 34 to 45, hopefully by the end of FY23. So that, that's what that large change in payroll relates to as we finally move towards getting fully staffed. The other item here I wanted to bring your attention to is the other employee cost. That's really travel expenses, training cost, recruitment cost, which in this environment could be significant, and other administrative cost. And with new employees, 
these costs tend to increase along with the increase in the number of employees. Next slide, please. This slide, I'm not gonna go into real detail, uh, but this is, as I alluded to earlier, we are gonna report this to you every month once the FY22 amended budget is approved, we will report at this level. And I think the biggest thing here is over time, we're working with Amtrak, rather than reporting uh, by route, we want to report each individual train because obviously they start at different times. There you see two trains here, or three trains even. There are different times associated with those. And so we actually wanna break this report down to showing all eight trains individually and that cost recovery factor I talked about from an overall operational perspective, we also wanna get to where we're applying that here. And not that that's an absolute, I think each train has different, uh, uh, different parameters around them, different purposes, but it, it's to help us assess how well we're doing with the train service. Next slide, please. This slide is, as in the other sections, to show you how we pay for our operation budget. And essentially, it's passenger ticket revenues. And I'll just focus on FY23. We're at about 51% cost recovery just from the ticket revenue. Then in the, the remainder of that difference is the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority, the dedicated funding coming out of the Commonwealth Rail Fund. One more point, I think, too, is after FY23, there will be no further federal credits, at least as of right now. So before I move to the next slide, that really takes us through the three sections of the budget, the amendment that we're proposing for FY22, as well as the proposed FY23 budget we need to present to the CTB in February. So before I go on, let's take a moment and field any questions. Any questions? This is Maria Zimmerman with a quick question. Sure. I, I'm sorry, did you say with the 51% um, kind of, I'll call it fare box recovery or, or from ticket revenues, is that based on kind of what we're currently seeing with COVID or is that based on the pre-COVID operating? So, Maria, that, that number, the $62.7 million, $62 million is based off of Amtrak's projections for FY22. And they don't provide projections into the future. And what I would say to your question is, I feel that we've been, once again, conservative. I said we were conservative last December because of the pandemic, because of the two variants that have come about. It also made us concerned. So we have been conservative in our revenue estimates um, throughout. I'll, I'll leave it that way. Yeah, but it's definitely post-COVID. It, it assumes COVID. So it's okay. And I'm going to add too that we we didn't realize we didn't back last December we didn't know when we got to this past summer we had no idea we'd be back at 70 percent of ridership. So then the variants hit September and now here in December. The ridership has held pretty well, even though the two variants have hit. And I'll say 70% return from a mode, tra transportation mode perspective, I think we have fared really well. Um, but even then, we have been conservative in those revenue estimates. All right, well, moving on then to the next slide. This is part of the budget we do want to propose. I really should have put board management reserve on this title because we want to propose a reserve for you as the board to manage. Um, and if we need to, if we have a proposal, we would obviously have to come to you for your approval. But all the capital projects that Shannon spoke to you about, they all have contingency built in at certain levels, um, which are for known risk, 
and even to some degree there's unknown risk. This reserve is really for unforeseen items within those capital projects. But just as much in my mind, this reserve is to allow a funding reserve so if op other opportunities present themselves, you would have the ability to move forward versus uh, having to look at your whole budget and potentially eliminate other projects. So that's what we're proposing here to y'all is uh, what we call a board management reserve. We did a lot of financial modeling uh, since September, a lot of new revenue estimates, uh, both up and down with our different revenue sources. And added some uh, cost as you've seen. With that being said, in the modeling we've done, we do have about 50, $55 million available over the next three to four years then the financial model and what we are going to recommend as part of the uh, budget action when we get to the FY23 recommendation uh, on February 1 is that $15 million be set aside into this board management reserve. And the last column here when it says metric, it's not really a performance metric, it's really ideas to think about what is the appropriate level or dollar amount that should be put into the reserve? Is it 10% of the total capital projects budget for the 10 years we're working on? Is it 10% of the annual capital expenditures in a year? And I'm just using 10%. That's really the idea here is for y'all to be thinking about as we move forward, if there are other funds available, what is an amount that's reasonable to have sitting in a reserve? So going forward Madam to the Chair, next slide. If I could just a, a comment on the uh, management reserve. And so as, as you said, <coughs> capital projects all have their <coughs> contingency uh, reserves that, uh, that re they're required to have. So this is, in, this is something different from that. And um, so it's, an opportunity uh, fund or enhancement fund to be used for transportation related um, items. So I, I want to say that this is a, you know, a really good thing to put into the budget. Uh, we should also look at some guidance for how we might uh, allocate it or what sorts of projects we want to, uh, to have a, you know, um, considered. But, uh, but I, I think good job including this as part of, part of their budget. Yes, I, I, I think we feel a lot better. I know Mike, DJ would say this, with the estimates we're bringing to y'all with the current budget, we feel a lot better about them. We did include level of where we are in that planning process in the budget. If you look at the document, you'll see we kind of rated it one through seven of how how far along we are, but we feel a lot better about our estimates at this point. That being said, there are every big $4.1 billion, $4 billion of capital projects. There's going to be some things that come up, but I like the spirit of the opportunities this fund can also present. As opposed to a great idea comes along and we don't have any money to, do, to even pursue it. So. Moving along, um, this slide really just wanted to show you all the, the core VPRA revenues. Um, and main point, uh, Jennifer had mentioned this earlier, the Finance Committee. We did, compared to December of last year, to this December, there was a significant uptick in the revenue estimates. I think there was a little bit, I'm not the economist for the state, but I think there was a little bit of what we did, there was a little bit of conservatism in estimating revenues because there was so much uncertainty. That being said, the action, that, that second bullet is really a comparison to the revenues at a different point in time back from, I think it was in May when we got a revenue estimate. If you go back to the December that we did in last year's budget, it's actually 170 a month. 
$179 million increase in our core revenue. Next slide. These next two slides are really just a summary of everything we've talked about. So capital projects, we've got, we adjusted the I-95 corridor program to the comprehensive rail agreement, adding in Western Rail Initiative, which is getting ready to kick off here in the next month or two. And then uh, added a slight amount for other capital projects. On the grant side, uh, we added in that DRPT managed grants of $22 million. And on top of that, uh, as far as VPRA managed grants, there's about $168 million related to the Western Rail Initiative. And the last thing I'll say here is there was about $24.6 million, if you added the numbers up that Shannon pointed out earlier, that are new grants in this budget compared to the approved FY22 budget related to PTC and related to station state of good repair. And as uh, Ms. Barnhart was pointing out earlier, I think on the station state of good repair, I think we have a good case uh, on several of those that we're gonna go look to see if the feds can maybe supplant of some of the funds that we have allocated. Next slide, please. Operating budget. So FY22 approved the FY22 amendment, $33 million decrease. Trains didn't start, federal credits were applied, more revenue than we thought, and a slight adjustment to admin. FY22 amended the FY23 proposed. The federal credits aren't as significant Two new trains we hope to start this summer, so it'll be a full year of their operation. And then there are additional maintenance costs related to the right-of-way that we now will own. And finally, our administrative budget has gonna see a fairly large increase uh, during FY23 as we actually get closer to fully staffed up. Next slide, please. And this last slide really is, um, it really is supposed to tell the story for the FY23 budget. And once again, we need to recommend the budget forward and forward that budget document to CTD by code on February 1st. So I think the plan right now is that we're gonna have another board meeting on February 1st, hopefully, recommend the budget forward to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. So we're certainly open to any feedback you have on the budget between now and then um, to work through any of that. Once that's presented to the CTD middle of February, we'll do a presentation for them about the detail. I hope to get CTD to approve the budget earlier this year in April instead of May and come to you in May for final approval of that FY23 budget. That being said, it's not on this page, but the FY22 budget amendment, we are hopeful to bring a resolution to you today to approve those changes so that we can begin reporting, and giving you a lot better information in the current year. And that is the last slide we have. Any questions? Anybody on the phone? Okay, thank you. So um, we do need to take an action on the amended FY22 budget. Um, however, I'd like to do that after lunch. We actually need a physical quorum. We're one person short. I know Ms. Dorsch had to run to take a, a phone call, but she'll be back after lunch. So um, what I'd like to do is take that action after lunch. Um, why don't we plan for, um, to reconvene at, for those of you on the phone, um, at one o'clock. We will have um, our, our auditor, um, who was actually supposed to meet with the finance committee this morning, but was unable to come. He'll be joining us by phone. I think just to give a very quick update. Um, we'll have one agenda item after that, and then we will need to go into closed session. 
um, as well uh, after that. So, but we should still be out of here um, by three o'clock today as planned. So, um, okay. So why don't we do this when we go ahead and um, break for lunch? I believe lunch is down um, down the hallway on the right, um, and then um, we will reconvene at one o'clock. For those of you on the phone. Um, we will uh, be back in a little while and we'll look forward to rejoining you then. So, thank you. Uh, Rob Churchman with Carrie Beckert. We had a very good and productive audit working with them this year. I'm uh, pleased to say there weren't any uh, issues, unqualified opinion. Um, so set a high bar, I guess, going forward. And with that, uh, Rob, I think he has certain required communications as part of, part of the audit process that uh, he wants to relay to y'all and with that I'm gonna hopefully get him to connect through Webex I think he is Rob are you on the phone yes ma'am I'm here okay can you speak up a little bit it's a little hard to hear you oh there you are oh, no, sure nice is that better that's better no there you are okay <laughs> great thank you for being here oh uh, thank you for uh allowing me to be here at not the uh the earlier session I have uh on route to see you this morning, I uh, had a positive family household test. Mm -hmm. So I brought myself back home. But as Steve mentioned, there are certain communications that are required to be provided to those charged with governance at an entity, regardless of whether it's a uh, not-for-profit or international, international conglomerate and so forth. And I have those uh, ready to be discussed. Were you going to, I set the slides over, am I going to control the slides from my side or, or, is, or is you going to bring them up on your side? I, I think we have the ability to do, to do them here if you just let them know when, yep, there we go. Sure. Just let them know okay. when you need to change slides. Will do. Uh, next slide, please. I have four key areas I need, to, well, three that I have to talk to you about and the fourth one, the purple one, is, is sort of just an FYI of what's going to happen or, or is, is happening in the governmental um, accounting standards area for the next week, uh, I'm sorry, for the next years coming forward. Next slide, please. Engage with services, next slide. Now, you may be saying, Rob, we, we, what you're gonna be telling us, what we're seeing right now, we know we hired you to do an audit. We know we hired you to do this and that. Well, um, the standards don't presume that those on this call right now or those present uh, in the audience uh, had any uh, discussion or knowledge of what our audit, our audit contract uh, conveys and so forth. So they require us to go through these uh, items each time, regardless of whether or not, again, um, I've had clients who, who heard me say this five, six years in a row because they, they've stayed on the audit committee or finance committee and so forth. Uh, but I start to say it anyway because, again, the standards require it. But we're hired to do an audit of your finance statements as of your first full fiscal year end, 6 30 21. Uh, because of the nature of some of your funding and revenue streams, we are required to do that not only in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards, but also with government auditing standards. And then also, if you had reached enough revenue amounts, uh, expenditures amounts for uh, that were federally related, you would have had to have what we call a uniform guidance audit, which in the old days was just simply called a single audit. They changed they changed the terminology a little bit uh, several years back to kind of make the terminology more global. Uh, but in essence, it's, it's a single audit. Uh, of your federal dollars and you did not have enough money this year to require that but it is anticipated you will have enough money uh, from the federal side next year for us to do that audit and then also because you're a, a state authority uh, the auditor of public accounts of the commonwealth of virginia has some specifications that are required by us as auditors to do uh, over authorities boards and commissions now for those of you who may have some ties to city or county uh, they have the same thing but they're much more uh, there's much more of them 
at a city or county level as opposed to authorities, boards, and commissions. But we still have to do it. And there are in areas, for example, like cash, um, some, some investment steps, um, some conflict of interest steps, and so forth. And we do those for uh, any authority that is um, that we're auditing for in the state of Virginia. Next slide, please. Now, the most important slide is the next slide that, that's going to come up after. Next slide, please. And that's the overall audit results. Uh, our opinion, we, we write an, an opinion on the financial statements that was unmodified. Uh, that is a, again, getting back to the global area, that is a global term that has been modified. In the old days, it would be called unqualified. But because of the international auditing standards, they wanted to kind of get the entire world using some of the some similar terminology. We changed it to unmodified. What, what it means is, is that we found that your statements are fairly presented in all material respects. And of course, it generally accepted accounting principles. It's the audit opinion you want to have from your auditor. Uh, it's the best one you can get. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, because of the nature of some of your funding and the fact we had to do a government auditing standards uh, audit also, uh, that's our second bullet there. That's the internal control of financial reporting and compliance. That also is unmodified. Again, the, the, the perfect opinion you want to have from your, from your auditor. And then on Virginia compliance, we had no matters to report there either. With regards to um, compliance with laws and regulations, we don't do an audit that is that gives you an absolute opinion on all compliance across all borders uh, of your operations, but we are required to give you a, a report that says if we found anything. And again, as it states here on the screen, uh, we had no matters of non-compliance that we thought needed to be reported to you regarding the material effect uh, on the financial statements, and that includes also um, debt agreements and so forth. Again, this slide is the perfect slide you want to hear from your auditors. And it's a testament to the finance uh, department's uh, operations and abilities, uh, Mr. Pitter and, and his crew, in, in getting this uh, level of opinion in the first year of existence. Next slide, please. Actually, there'll be two more slides. So next one also. Getting into my last required section of discussion, uh, we're going to be talking about some of the required areas that, uh, again, because these are standards that relate to any size, breadth, or depth of the entity, um, not just commercial or governmental or not profit and so forth, uh, these are required to be discussed each time. Now, I'll, I will admit, as I have in many other sessions, that some of these items aren't really applicable to you. Uh, but because they are required, because they're, they're meant to, to, to cover the entire universe of audits, I had to at least let you know that, that I took them into consideration and or they weren't applicable. But first, as you see, there are accounting policies. Uh, if this was an entity that had uh, many years of existence, uh, there could be a chance that policies could change over years. And because you're not there 24-7 and we're not there 24-7, we are required to let you know if we, if we are made aware of any material changes to the accounting and recording of, of activity. And all your policies, in essence, as it says, states there, were basically put into place this year. Uh, I, there may be a very real possibility that next year I might be reporting to you that there could there have been some changes in the policy because as you grow as an entity uh, in your life, there will be times when you might want to change a policy here or there. But in this case, being the first year of existence, all your policies were new. With regards to the financial statements themselves, because no, no entity can afford to have an audit that audits 100% of every, uh, every item and is there 24-7, 365. Uh, there are some things that, uh, there are some things in, in accounting that where you can't get a solid, absolute number for, you have to make an estimate. You can't always have a, a receipt that you can tie something to or an invoice you can tie into. And in your case, you have a couple areas where you have, uh, currently you have estimates in place and then the, the last bullet here is when you're gonna have some going forward. But you know, it allows for doubtful counts. If you have receivables and there's a possibility, and this is very heavily uh, related to government arena, cities and counties, for example, for taxes and so forth, you make an estimate of what you're gonna collect because you don't know exactly uh, every dollar you're gonna get in. You hope you're gonna get it all, obviously. Uh, but we look, at the, we look at the allowance for doubtful counts calculation. We look at your depreciable lie for, fixed, for capital assets. You, know, you have to make a guess on how long somebody's gonna live and therefore you're gonna depreciate it each year. So you look at those lives, and then going forward, you'll have actuarial liabilities that you're gonna have estimates of, pensions and, and other, other post-employment benefits. So really wasn't the case this year because of your, your newness, uh, your, your existence coming into play this is one year. But for all estimates and, and judgments, we have to look at them to make sure they make sense, to make sure they are, in your case, next year, we'll look at them to make sure they're comparable year over year, uh, to make sure that they are not out of the realm of, of, of reason 
uh, that you are not uh, recording something, uh, an allowance account at uh, say 20% of the receivable when everybody else in the entire plan is at 10, for example. So we do look at, at how you stack up against your peers and so forth when we're looking at the estimates. Uh, we noted nothing in our testing this year that makes us think that any of your estimates are out of the realm of possibility or unreasonable and so forth. And again, next year, like I said, uh, I'll, I'll report back to you on whether or not they, they, they stay comparable. Now, estimates can change year over year, but making sure that they are the reasonable uh, reason for them changing and not just something where, and again, and this is this is really relevant to government, but it, it's, it's also hyper relative to corporations where they may change an estimate year over year because they want to modify where their bottom line is going to come out. That's why it's important for us to talk to those charge of governments about the estimates that, that are in place. With regards to the last section here on this slide, uh, we're required, unless they're just obviously trivial, we're, we're required to let you know if we have any any changes that we proposed uh, to the general ledger, to the accounting, to the debits and credits, uh, either that we proposed and was made or, or proposed it was not made because for, for various reasons. And generally it's because they're immaterial to the overall statements. In the case of the authority, we had no correct, uh, uncorrected, when, you, when we use the word misstatements, it makes it look ominous, but it's really not ominous, it's just the words we have to use. We had no uh, miscorrect, uh, uncorrected misstatements that we asked the finance team to make in order for us to believe that the statements are fairly presented. Again, another example of the opinion you want to have from your auditor on the operations of the audit and the finance statements themselves. Next slide, please. Okay. So. This looks very ominous because I have words like disagreements, difficulties on there, so forth. Uh, and it's at some clients, I have had this slide be frankly three or four pages long because not every audit is without disagreements, is without difficulties. Uh, but I'm required to let you know if I have came across any of those in my audit for your authority. And we had no disagreements with management over reporting or, or presentation of the financial statements and disclosures. And we had no difficulties encountered uh, with working with them and wanting to get, get information from them, uh, getting um, proposed changes to the presentation of the financial statements uh, through them and so forth. So again, I, I sound like a broken record, but it's the opinion you want to have or report you want to have from your auditor. And then also this last item here on this slide, I'm required to make you aware if there's ever any material communications that you would not have been privy to uh, throughout the audit. Um, that could be a, a significant matter in a, in a legal letter, that could be other matters. The item that that's here is just to make you aware of, uh, of what this is. The standards require, because I give you four pieces of paper that goes into your document, that's your financial statements, the opinion and the, and the GAS report. Um, there, this letter is required because it wants to document, or the standards require it to, be, to happen because to document the responsibilities of management over the financial statements because they are not our financial statements. They are your financial statements. And so this management representation letter is a standardized letter. It's it's likely the same across any accounting firm you're looking at because they are really just straightforward items. And what it represents is from management to us as the auditor that uh, they recognize that they uh, that we have done our audit in accordance with the engagement letter, that they are your financial statements, uh, that you provided all records that will be relevant to me um, in, in a case where Maybe you've had a federal or state regulator come in and look at your operations for some reason that you've given me a copy of that report. So these are these are standard representations that would that would have um, that would cause me as an auditor to have an issue if a client came back and wanted to change them. They're literally that straightforward. And so if I ever had a client come back and say, Rob, I can't represent this to you because X, Y, or Z, then I as the auditor have to think, well, why why is that true? What what am I missing? to make sure that I have the complete knowledge of the operations so that I can give a full opinion on the financial statements. Uh, in the case of the authority, they did not request any changes to my standard representations. Uh, they signed it and provided it back to me as 99.9% as, as .9 of my clients always have. And so, but I'm, a main, I'm required to make you aware that that letter exists and was provided to us without any pause uh, through that. The, the core part of what I had to talk to you about. Um, I mentioned earlier that, this, that the standards um, are for any kind of an entity. And this first item here is something that's more um, relevant or more uh, happens more often uh, in, in the commercial arena as it does governments. It's, 
Uh, I've never had it in my 30, 35 plus years uh, happen, but if, if I ever became aware of a, of a client of mine who was asking other audit firms um, how, what they would let them report, how they how the, let them report something that maybe is a, I'll use the word controversial, but maybe it's something that has some gray area. And it, it, we call it in our, in our industry, shopping the opinion, where an entity may talk to three different firms and they get the, they get the right answer they want from, from one of the firms, that's who they go with. Um, I'm, again, it, it's never happened in government for me. It's more of a commercial uh, risk, but I may, I'm required to make you aware if I became aware of any of that discussion. And I'm not aware of any discussion that, that the finance team has had with, with, manage, uh, with other firms about uh, accounting, reporting, and, and presentation. This is probably as important as anything else on the, on the other two previous slides, uh, in my middle bullet here, independence. Um, I'm required to make you aware that we're, we know of no transaction, no uh, personnel in my firm, uh, no activities with the firm or other firms that would cause us to be not independent of you. And why is that important? Well, if I'm not an independent, I'm not objective, and my opinion means nothing to you. So we have steps we perform uh, yearly at our clients to make sure that our, our, our personnel don't have relationships, whether it be with a uh, uh, maybe a, a finance person at, at, the, at an entity, maybe it's a, maybe it's a um, uh, family member or so forth that works or does business with an entity and so forth. So we, we, we take those steps to make sure that we are independent. And I would have to tell you right now, well, I would have to tell you much earlier because I wouldn't have been able to give you an opinion, but I'm telling you now that uh, we're not aware of anything that, that would have impaired our independence. And then my last matter here is just to make you aware that uh, in your set of finance gyms, as you've seen, there's a section up front called the management discussion analysis. And that is required by uh, GASB, the, the people that set up journal accepted accounting principles, as a tool for you to speak to the reader in, it's intended to be in more, um, more lay people terms, more uh, less accounting jargon, to kind of tell the reader what happened during the year, what significant activities occurred, maybe you've issued debt, maybe you've and maybe you've started a new pension plan, and so for that, that's where we, that's where this gets talked about. We don't give an opinion on it; we're not required to, but we do read it. We do provide uh, guidance, uh, suggestive uh, criticisms, uh, corrections. Uh, hey, have you thought about saying it this way? Hey, have you thought about presenting this and so forth? Um, but we don't give an opinion on it. But we do make sure the numbers tie. Oh, I'm sorry, to use non-accounting terms, uh, agree from there up to the financial statements and so forth. Uh, those are my required communications under the standards. Uh, next two slides, please. Thank you. Um, uh, just to make you aware that in the year we're sitting in now, fiscal year 22, there are some changes that are coming in the account auditing industry, and that these may or may not relate to you, but I want to make you aware of them. Uh, to the extent you have extensive leases, uh, there are some changes in how those go will be reported and recorded going forward, uh, as opposed to how they are now. And then also to the extent that, that an entity had construction period costs, that they were incurring for interest. Uh, this is the year where the GASB, uh, who sets GAAP, uh, says stop recording that and, and don't record it anymore as capitalized interest. Um, our audit opinion actually would change this year. The AICPA has put out standard changes for um, hope. Their, their hope is to make our opinion as an industry um, easier to understand and provide more insight into what an audit actually does and what can be inferred from a audit opinion as with regards to the comfort you can have on the numbers that have been presented. Next slide, please. And then just FYI, uh, let you know, coming down the pike for 23, there are some um, standards that are being put in place for uh, the GISB uh, in, their, in their research noted that there appeared to be a higher level of public partner, public private partnerships going on throughout the United States. And so they wanted to put some guides out there so that entities would be comparable consistently presenting their, their information in the same way. So again, this, this is probably not going to relate to 98% of my clients, but I want to make you aware that, they, that these new standards are, co are coming out, will be required to be put in place for 63023 if you find yourself in a relationship such as the PPPs. And then also finally, because of how uh, so many uh, businesses and operations and so forth are getting up into the cloud web services and so forth. Uh, they put some guidance out for subscription-based information technology agreements, basically 
your, your cloud services. Again, to make sure that people across the board are pre presenting that, recording it, disclosing it consistently across the states to make sure that the, the statements will have uh, be as relevant and as knowledgeable as possible for the reader uh, to understand the relationships that are, that are falling under this subscription-based information. Again, you know, this is not going to be relevant to every one of my clients, uh, but I just want to make you aware that that's out there, and I'll be talking with finance management uh, over these last two pages to make sure, you know, throughout the entire calendar year here that we're in, well, fiscal year right now, then well into the next fall, to make sure that there's, uh, if there's any, uh, if these are, are relevant, that we'll make sure we're tackling them properly and presenting them properly in the year that they are due. And those are my required communications with two slides at the end for, hey, here's what's coming down the pike that may or may not be relevant to you. Um, GASB, the GASB does reserve the right to, to change their mind a lot and put out more guidance. And so it's, 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 it's a revolving wheel. But these are the ones that are, uh, if they were going to be relevant, that, that we hasn't come up yet, but basically questions or comments. Anything? Rob? Think, Rob, are you still there? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, we lost you on video for a moment, so. Oh, good for you though. Look at this, look at this mug. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that, I think what you were saying was that concludes your report is, does anybody have any questions uh, for Rob? Anybody on the phone with questions related to the audit? All right, I think we're good then. I just wanted to say for Rob, uh, before you go, just good working with your team, very professional, and we look forward to going forward. I, I think we have at least two more years on a contract um, and maybe a couple of renewals. So thanks to you and your team. Oh, thank you, and as I mentioned, it, getting your statements out the way you did in the first year of existence um, with so many things going on in your operations. It's a testament to your, to you and your crew's uh, ability, professionalism, background, knowledge, understanding uh, uh, that you were able to get this done uh, in the time period you did. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Thank you, Steve, as well. Um, we do have one action item that we need to take related to the amended FY22 budget. Um, we um, got a presentation on that earlier. Um, we do, would like to get a um, motion. I oh, I should note as well that the um, Finance Committee did review it this morning and did also vote to recommend that the amended budget be forwarded to the board for approval. Um, and so we do need to approve that. I believe there was, was there a resolution in the, the package? I believe I um, was there. Yeah. Um, and this is just for the amended FY22 budget. We will be um, taking action on the FY23 budget at the February meeting, which in that case would be to forward it, the 23 budget to the CTB. But for this one, it would be adoption of the FY22 amended budget. So, any questions? Okay. Would anybody like to make a motion or? Um, I'll move. Okay, great. Great. All right. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and so now we are going to have a presentation. Um, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for our closed session um, to discuss um, some of the information we sent you related to Nor Norfolk Southern. Um, Emily, is though, is going to give us a quick presentation on a few studies that um, we have done in response to requests by the General Assembly. And um, so those reports, once they are forwarded to the General Assembly, um, are also public information. Steve, do you have one more thing? Yes, if I may, sorry. Um, <laughs> on the audit, the actual audited financial statements, I cannot remember if I forwarded it to the full board, so we will make sure you get that this afternoon. And if I didn't send it, please accept my apologies. Okay, great, thank you. So um, there are three studies here in particular that we'll be discussing um, related to passenger rail expansion. Um, and I'll let Emily go ahead and get started. 
Thank you very much, Director Mitchell. Uh, thanks for having me. Again, Emily Stock, a DRPT Rail Chief, and I'll be talking about the inner city passenger rail related General Assembly studies that uh, some have gone to the General Assembly already, um, some are about to go. Uh, next slide, please. We had three that we focused on this past year. We had one for Bedford, one for Bristol, and one for what's known as the Commonwealth Corridor, and I'll show you a map in a, in a minute. Um, for, all, for all three of these studies, we looked at um, potential costs and, um, and potential ridership. Um, I'll start out uh, uh, for, for long-term um, expansions of, of passenger rail, so long-term plans for uh, expansion of passenger rail. And as you all are aware, uh, VPRA is um, focused on, on all things passenger rail. DRPT is still, um, still does work on long-range plans um, like this and uh, like the Virginia statewide rail plan. Next slide. So for Bedford, uh, DRPT has actually been working with um, local groups in the Bedford area for a couple of years now on a feasibility study uh, that we already had underway and uh, just recently completed to look at the potential for um, an expansion of, of rail to uh, rail, a rail stop to Bedford. Uh, that Roanoke service that that, um, that goes up to Lynchburg and, and eventually to the Northeast Corridor goes right by Bedford. And, um, and we estimated the cost of a, a new rail station there and the potential ridership uh, that we could expect for a stop at Bedford. And then the General Assembly asked us to work with Norfolk Southern to do rail traffic controller modeling to see what type of freight improvements might be needed in order to accommodate that service, uh, because of course this is on a Norfolk Southern rail line. So next slide. So I'll go ahead and report the, the results of both of those studies, both for the, uh, the DRPT-led study. Uh, we looked at, um, at a potential station location that was just east of downtown, um, and uh, we expect that the, the construction cost for the preferred location uh, is about $11 million. And um, if for this study and for the other studies that I'll be talking about, I'm happy to um, talk with you all about this in more detail. I know we're, we're a little pressed for time today, um, but I'm happy to, uh, to, um, to tell you more about this. And of course, the full reports will be available for you to, uh, for you to review as well. And uh, the very good news was that when we worked with Norfolk Southern, their results showed that, um, that operations modeling uh, showed non-material new delay for Norfolk Southern freight operations with service included um, in this study. So that was great news. That meant that we didn't have to add anything to that $11 million to do um, capital improvements um, on the, the freight side, uh, freight operation side. So that's, that's wonderful. And then we also did a um, ridership analysis and we looked at the total ridership that, that we would expect to come to Bedford. Um, and then we also looked at what the incremental ridership would be because we know that, that putting a station between existing Ra um, Roanoke station and the existing Lynchburg station means that we would probably siphon off some riders from, from those stations as well. Uh, but even with that, uh, we're looking at ridership of about, um, about 10,000 uh, per year at, uh, at Bedford which puts it online with, um, with Quantico or Ashland, so somewhere between Quantico and Ashland. So I uh, can move on to the next slide. And some of our next steps, uh, we did apply for a Chrissy planning grant with the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, we're waiting to hear back from that, but late in November, we applied for some additional funding to do a NEPA study that would lead to um, further design and, um, and ultimately um, implementation, hopefully, depending on, um, on funding availability moving forward. But we are going to be starting an Amtrak throughway bus um, to serve Bedford in spring of 2022 is what we're estimating. So that's another great development that will help us to understand what the demand might be for a, um, for a rail stop at Bedford. Next slide, please. So the next study that we looked at, another uh, long range uh, potential expansion for 
uh, passenger rail is to extend passenger rail to Bristol. And as you all know, we're looking at passenger rail expansion to Christiansburg right now, so this would, um, would build upon that. And I don't want to undersell the fact um, for this study and for the, for the Commonwealth Corridor study that I'll talk about um, that the host railroad um, has not evaluated or agreed to the proposed future service. So we, um, we've let the host railroads know about these, these studies that are out there, um, both for Bristol and Commonwealth Corridor, but they have not agreed to, um, uh, to the proposed service, and that's a work that we would need to do as, as, um, as this moves forward. So we reviewed a number of previous studies that were developed um, to look at Bristol service, the potential cost and benefit of, of Bristol service, uh, to understand the methodology for ridership and for, and for cost estimates, so we weren't starting at square one. Um, and then the, but the current study is an independent estimate that, um, that, that builds on that earlier work and, um, and looks at updated service assumptions, especially now that we have uh, Roanoke service under our belts. Next slide, please. Great. And so um, one I item that I want to point out, and this has a huge bearing for the potential for, um, for capital investment, um, the potential for, um, for capital costs uh, for service between Christiansburg and Bedford is the location that's chosen for a, um, for a New River Valley site. So um, the New River Valley station assessment is being done right now by VPRA. Uh, they're looking at some, some different options there. And so there are a few different corridors that where, that where that station could go. We talked about a mall site. There's also a site called the Merrimack site. And depending on where that ends up, um, it's possible that, that there would need to be a passenger rail tunnel built um, if uh, one of the, one of the um, the station locations on this uh, northern Whitehorn District um, line is chosen. Um, so, so that's something to, to keep in mind because there's going to be a big range of capital cost estimates um, in the next slide. So capital costs, uh, we are looking at somewhere between um, half a billion dollars and $1.5 billion. And so that, uh, that tunnel that I was talking about along the Whitehorn District route, we're thinking would be about a billion dollars to build. Um, and so, uh, so a lot will, will, um, will hinge on that, that station location that, um, that's being decided in New River Valley. Uh, we're thinking for operations and maintenance costs. We're looking at five million to five point six million dollars per year, and there would be there would be an offset uh, depending on ridership that would that would come into play. And then uh, with regard to ridership, um, again because this is long range, um, we are looking at somewhere between ten thousand and fifteen and a half thousand uh, riders per year to a station in Bristol. So next slide. Next steps for Bristol. We have had a conversation, as uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier, with the state of Tennessee. It would be great to be able to partner with Tennessee and look at um, extending this not just to the, the Northeast Corridor, but, um, but also down uh, toward Atlanta as, um, as services are ramping up um, toward the south, too, because of the geography. Uh, this area and the, the amount of time that it takes to get from Bristol, would take to get from Bristol to, uh, to the Northeast Corridor. And there is a Southeast uh, Regional Rail Plan that FRA put out um, not too long ago. And um, it does show an emerging route between Bristol and um, Knoxville down to Chattanooga and Atlanta. So we'd like to continue that conversation with the Southeast Rail Coalition. Um, or commission, I'm sorry, uh, which, of which uh, Tennessee is a, a member and Georgia, and, um, and then continue to work with localities in, in, in the region on the number of stops that, that we may consider between New River Valley and Bristol. Um, and of course, uh, working with Norfolk Southern as well. Next slide, please. I'll move over to the proposed Commonwealth Corridor study. Uh, this is a corridor that would stretch from um, Hampton Roads uh, through Richmond, then over to Charlottesville, and then um, down that Western Rail Corridor to Lynchburg, Roanoke, and eventually the New River Valley. Um, so we looked at a statewide travel demand model to identify popular submarkets um, that helped define this route. Um, next slide, please. 
And um, we did quite a bit of public outreach. We did some, um, some s surveys to uh, figure out how this would work because it was really not, um, this, this isn't a, a corridor that's gone through a lot of study like the way that Bristol and, and Bedford have. So we found that most of the people who were answering the survey really preferred a one seat ride. Um, it wasn't necessarily small local trips. Um, this is passengers who would wanna go uh, the entire corridor. Uh, we looked at two daily round trips between Newport News and the New River Valley Station in Christiansburg. That's, um, that was one of the assumptions that we made early on to make this service worthwhile. Next slide. So we found along that corridor, and you, and you may have noticed that there, there is a portion of that corridor that goes along the Buckingham Branch Railroad um, uh, between Charlottesville and Doswell, just, just north of Richmond. And we found that the, the areas that needed the most improvement um, include that, that Charlottesville to Doswell section that, um, that currently has no passenger rail service. The other, um, the other corridors along the way do have passenger rail service now. Um, and um, and we, we do know that we would have to have a storage and servicing facility at either end of, of the route as well. We'd have to look at that in the future. And, uh, but the, for, the good thing is, is that all segments of the corridor do have existing track now. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we modeled two daily round trips between Newport News and Christiansburg. Uh, we found that uh, this service could draw as many as 169,400 potential annual passengers. And uh, the capital costs would range from 319 million to 416 million in 2030 dollars. And the uh, O&M costs um, would be somewhere around 27 million. And there may be some offsets there um, uh, for the ridership that we get um, in that area. But these, of course, are, uh, you know, are looking um, far into the, into the future. Uh, we did use 2021 dollars for, for capital costs, uh, but there's a lot of work that would need to be done uh, to, to see exactly how this service would work, especially work with the, with the railroads themselves. Next slide, please. I think that might be all of my slides, and I went very fast because I wanted to leave you all lots of time to talk about your, um, your next agenda item. Are there, if, are there any questions now um, that, that you all can think of? If not, I can answer questions offline. I'm happy to do that. Any questions for Emily? I mean, I don't usually like to ask questions, about, but I'm going to ask this. The, the Bedford um, effort, what, what, what I may have missed it. What's the time frame that you're looking at for that? So we are looking at adding Amtrak, an Amtrak throughway bus in uh, sometime this spring or summer, and uh, that's something that BPRA is working actively with um, Amtrak to, to get started. We wanna give it the, the best chance of success um, given the COVID um, issues that we've had. Um, and then it, a lot of this is gonna depend on, on availability of funding, uh, but right now we do have an application in right now for, for funding a NEPA study that would um, get us to the next step with the Federal Railroad Administration and then allow us to, to apply for, um, for further design and construction later on. And you mentioned that the number that you anticipate with Bedford was 10 to 12,000? That's right. Can you still some of the slide with those? I mean, with all our descriptions here, but the record is, the, I, I imagine the benefit to each one of those individuals in Bedford would be pretty darn large. Um, and I just learned that from Lynn Valley. So keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your time. We have a very active and, and um, uh, group of, or ad, of advocates there. Um, the, the, uh, I forgot what BFRRI stands for. But uh, we've had Bedford Franklin Regional Rail Initiative. That's right. And, mm -hmm. um, but we've had a very cooperative role with them throughout the whole study that, um, uh, that we did and have really appreciated the help that they've provided. So. I'm sure there'll be discussions when you talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So with that, um, we now are going to go into closed session. I believe our vice chair has a motion. I do, Madam Chairman. I uh, would move that the board convene in a closed session pursuant to section 2.2-3711A6 of the Code of Virginia for the purpose of discussing a project involving the investment of public funds where bargaining is involved 
and where the financial interest of the Commonwealth would be adversely affected if the discussion were made public at this time and pursuant to A11 for consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members uh, or consultants pertaining to probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. Additionally, I move that staff and attorneys attend the closed session because their presence is deemed necessary and will aid the board in its consideration of this matter. And if someone seconds that motion, we would then have a roll call. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, great. Um, would Joan, could you mm -hmm. call the roll please? Sure, those, are, those in favor say aye, those opposed say nay. Ms. Belova? Aye. Ms. Butler-Painter? Aye. Mr. Cardwell? Aye. Ms. Dorsch? Aye. Mr. Fizette? Mr. Hall. Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Ms. Moses Ned? Aye. Mr. Nichols? Aye. Mr. Sadid? Mr. Spore? Ms. Zimmerman? Aye. Great, thank you. So let me just make sure that our IT is. All right, great. Um, Vice Chair, would you like to <laughs> yes. read the statement? Uh, we are now going to take a roll call vote, uh, and members should say aye if they agree with the following or abstain. Well, no, not for this. Uh, <laughs> let's see. To the best of our knowledge, during the closed meeting, the only uh, the only matters heard, discussed, or considered were those matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and only those public business matters, matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed session or closed meeting was convened. So moved. Great, is there a second? Okay. Um, Joan, may I call the roll call? Absolutely. Ms. Belova? Aye. Ms. Butler-Painter? Aye. Mr. Cardwell? Aye. Ms. Dorsch? Aye. Mr. Fizette? Aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Ms. Moses Ned? Aye. Mr. Nichols? Aye. Mr. Sadid? Mr. Spore? Ms. Zimmerman? Aye. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so now um, we would like to, and I, I, as DJ noted, we did send out a decision brief and resolution as well. Um, which we would like now to now put to a vote as well. So is, would anyone like to make a motion? Madam Chairman, I'm happy to uh, move the resolution, which is authorization of uh, execution of comprehensive hey, well, rail agreement so between Norfolk Southern Railroad Railway Company and the That's Virginia long, Passenger yeah, Rail Authority. Great, thank so you. Moved. Is there a second? Second call. Thank you. All right, we're gonna do this as a roll call vote as well. Ms. Belova? Aye. Ms. Butler Painter? Yes, Mr. Cardwell? Aye. Ms. Dorsch? Aye. Mr. Fizette? Aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Mormon? I abstain. Ms. Moses Ned? Aye. Mr. Nichols? Aye. Mr. Sadid? Mr. Spore? Ms. Zimmerman? Aye. All right, so the motion passes. Very exciting. Well. Thank uh, you all. Yeah, that's that's all we have today, um, unless anybody else has any other business they'd like, like to bring up. All right, thank you all for coming. It's good to see everybody in person. Um, our next board meeting will be February 1st. Um, at that time, we'll also be taking action on the FY23 budget, um, but we'll have more information about the agenda going forward, so. And there, all right, there, thank you all. There had been a meeting that was in a previous calendar for I think it was January 25th or something like yeah, that. Yeah, we can take that one off take, the calendar. Take that off. We'll make sure that, we, actually what we'll do, we'll make sure we send you new calendar invitations and 
So you've got everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yep. All right. Thank you to everybody on the phone as well. Thank you. So we are adjourned. <laughs>